morning and one welcome to online anesthesia an anesthesia update in zoom platform sponsored by akrula and hosted by a1 logics and our media partner is anesthesia tv the relationship between pain medicine and anesthesia lies in the shared goal of ensuring patient's comfort and minimizing pain during and after the medical procedures that's why we have included pain update in our online anesthesia update Today we have two stalwarts of pain medicine, Dr. Guru Murthy sir and Dr. Madan Bandian sir, in our platform to deliver lectures on epidural steroids and its current concept and nerve entrapment syndrome. What is new? This will be followed by our video demo by splanchnic nerve neurolysis. How I do it by our young pain physician, Dr. Vishnu Kumar. Today's session is moderated by our own colleague and pain physician, Dr. Rajesh Jayaprakash of Madurai Meenachi Mission Hospital. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, one and all. Uh, so this in this online uh, anesthesia program. Uh, so this session is about uh, what is happening in pain medicine. Uh, uh, update on pain medicine. So we have uh, three uh, extreme pain physicians who are uh, full-time pain physicians here with us uh, to deliver uh, to share their experiences. The first uh, lecture is by Dr. Guru Murthy, a good friend of mine. Uh, he is from Trichy, he's a senior consultant doctor in Dr. Guru's Interventional Pain and Palliative Care. And he is going to talk about epidural steroids, what is the current concept. So uh, it's a very important topic that uh, even uh, anesthesiologists or pain physicians, so everyone does that epidural steroid day to day in their practice. So how to go ahead and what is the current concept related to that? So over to you, Guru, please share your data. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. So thank you, Anandal, for joining me, joining on this session in the morning. So thank you, Anastasia, Online Anastasia, for giving us the chance. So today, when we had a discussion, which topic to go ahead, so me and Rajesh were discussing and we thought, okay, let me go for a very common topic. Okay. So... Then we had uh, zeroed on epidural steroid. Um, is uh, Rajesh, is my si slides are visible? Yeah, 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 yeah. You are you are readily visible. Okay, fine. So we we had zeroed on epidural steroid. This is a very simple topic, right? If you ask any pain physicians who are busy in practicing in pain management, if you ask uh, what is the common procedure done by you in your pain clinic. Like, especially in the spine, they will say it's epidural steroid, right? So you're not even pain physicians. Most of the anesthesiologists, if you ask what is the procedure you do in pain medicine, then they may say in epidural steroid. This is very commonly done procedure. Even if you ask any of the pain physicians, okay, sir, can you tell me, so which procedure you are stuck very frequently? So again, the answer is epidural steroid. Okay, so though it's look like a simple procedure, we, have, we land up, Occasionally, if not very frequent, but this is the one procedure where we land up, we stuck up, we have find difficulty in putting those procedures. There are a lot of debates whether it works or not. So then we thought of, okay, we had got young doctors in this forum. Okay, then we thought of, okay, let me talk on the most common things. So we had started with epidural steroid. So these are the content we are just going to have a discussion for the next 30 minutes. I am going to dedicate more time for discussion. Okay, so I, I expect those who are the participants to come up with their questions. Epidural steroid, nothing to discuss more as a presentation, okay? So I will just wind up, try to wind up in 25 to 30 minutes. So whenever I uh, start reading anesthesiology, so I never read history. Even when I'm in pain medicine, I never read history. So my, because when I did my MD, the curriculum don't have that much importance for history. We don't get any questions in history. But when I started presenting, okay, then... When I started presenting on the forums, then I had to read something which is which I never done. So one thing is the history. So when I read the book epidural steroid, I just found this. So the first spinal puncture was done in 1985. The first injection for pain is done in 1901. Right? It was done by two people on different occasions, one by Sicard and Kathleen. So Sicard had got good results in that block and Kathleen don't have any good results. So the answer is because Sikard did transforaminal and Kathleen did caudal. So he used, Sikard used more volume and Kathleen used less volume. So Sikard has got good results and Kathleen don't have that much good results for uh, sciatica. So 
it's it's not that thing the thing is it took almost 20 to 30 years for april to uh, the, the procedure started because sikat became a radiologist and katherine became a surgeon okay so they stopped doing the procedures in 1930 i think they started giving start april steroids this history i just wanted to insist because it's the line given there some innovations in the history of medicine spread quickly for example discovery of ether to anesthetic patient in 1846 spread across the atlantic from boston to paris and london in only 4 weeks for example these things spread very fastly but for example the epidural steroid or epidural treatment with local anesthetic took very long time so they almost took 2 to 3 to 3 decades for other people to realize okay we can start doing off so why i took up this slide is it's happening nowadays also so what we are doing most of uh, we anesthesiologists we are part of not very it's it's less numbers we are getting trained in pain management but when we come out we turn our path again to anesthesia so most of us are not coming to pain management and uh, even those who are practicing pain management they have to they have to struggle a lot to get their practice done because it is not because of not because of the skill it's because of the knowledge present among even our colleagues uh, we we can say that uh, if you ask someone as you do you do pain practice they may come up with the answer yes i do so then if you ask what is the thing you do they say i do epidural steroids okay i sometimes they will say i used to give morphine and all so just understand just giving epidural steroid is not equal to running a pain clinic okay so it needs more skill it needs more more knowledge so that's the one thing we have to occur rather than from anesthesia just doing anesthesia we can't get the skill of a pain management second thing is uh, though we say epidural steroid injection is very commonly done in pain clinic we are doing most of us not uh, not i am talking about as a common it's almost more than 90% of the epidural steroid done by anesthesiologist is done as a technical thing so you will be getting a patient from an orthopedic or a neurosurgeon and they will ask give epidural steroid and you will be just doing it so if any one of you can you answer so what is the common cause for failure for epidural steroid the answer is you are giving this technique you are giving the steroid in a wrong patient because most of us don't know what was the diagnosis most of us will think it's radiculopathy radiculopathy there are n number of causes which can cause back pain okay so it's only the clinical examination which is going to help you it is the diagnostic block which is going to confirm your back pain we just go on giving epidural steroid just for example the patient is not responding for analgesic just with back pain in a 60 year old male we just go on giving epidural steroids and the patient is not responding actually the diagnosis may be facet joint and you are giving in a wrong patient that's the most common cause for failure of epidural steroid you are giving a steroid you are not getting a response you are just telling that okay the steroid has failed no you are failed because you are done in a wrong patient this is the most common cause of failure in epidural steroid so what is the indication so we had got lot of indications for epidural steroids so if you go to the literatures they will have lot of case series lot of studies but the most common indication is discogenic pain radiculopathy canal stenosis and failed back surgery syndrome these are the four important indications for epidural steroids the most common thing will be radiculopathy because the results will be far better if you do it in radiculopathy other indications like coccidemia proctalgia figures acute herpes zoster and chronic pelvic pain and so on so you can try but you can you have to do it as a reserve procedure you just uh, cannot say okay i will try epidural steroid in this patient just you have to try everything if everything fails up then you can try with epidural steroid in these patients what are the contraindications as the anesthesiologist we already know so what are the contraindications but still we have to focus on very important thing which we always miss it that is glaucoma and increase intracranial pressure okay so this question you should always ask if you are going to epidural steroids i think most of us don't ask this when we are going for anesthesiology but this is a very important thing in epidural steroid you have to ask the patient what happens if you are not asking the question if the patient has got the angle closer glaucoma and you are just go on injecting sometimes it can cause retinal hemorrhage so if the patient has got in, increased intracranial pressure if you are just go on adding this 10 ml of epidural steroid then they may be go, going for coning so we should be very careful with these patients there are again there is a debate regarding antiplatelets okay so most of the interventions especially these epidural steroids we use it 
uh, we we are least bothered about NSAIDs and aspirin. But still, there are a lot of studies saying that okay, even you can do with clopidogrel, dabigatron, and everything you can do it off. But still, for the safety of the patient, better stop it as recommended as we follow it for anesthesiology. But only thing you have to switch over with heparin. Okay, don't if the patient is having a CVA and you are stopping antiplatelets. It's going to it's it's going to aggravate more. Better always always put it on some antiplatelets. So, for example, the patient with CVA for the last uh, less than six months, better put it on heparin and stop it off. Okay. So these are the methods as commonly we do. So we have got four regions: sacral, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. So if you look at the sacral, there are two options we do. We can do transforaminal or we can do caudal. Okay. For example, if it is a lumbar region. We can do interlaminar, caudal, and transforaminal. In case of thoracic, we can do interlaminar and transforaminal. It's a really difficult thing to do it in thoracic. But in case of cervical, the option is interlaminar and transforaminal. These are the options available. Just I'll be just going to tell what is the advantage of each techniques, why we prefer those techniques than other techniques. So let me start with next slide. So let me start with caudal epidural. I think this is the most commonly procedure done by an anesthesia uh, pain physician, not by an anesthesia, especially uh, in pediatric case. Yeah, cardiac epidural is the most commonly done thing in anesthesia. But in pain management, I think if you are if you are talking about epidural steroid, means most probably we are talking about cardiac epidural steroid, right? So what is the advantage of doing cardiac epidural? Here you don't know any two any specialists like two needle. We no need of a lower technique, right? So you need just a simple needle, long needle. So we routinely use Venfron stillet. So that's 18 gauge infrared still is good enough because it has got lateral line. So even if you are needle, if needle is hitting the bone, there will be a lateral line there you can inject off. So another thing is nothing to worry about dura. Until S2, there is no dura. Just you can, no need to go by millimeter, millimeter. Just go, just in centimeters, just go, go, go. Just cross the S3, keep it there, keep it in the midline, inject contrast and do it off. So even S2 is have a good margin. So if you are reaching S1, you may puncture dura, but we always say, okay, keep it at the level of S3. It's a very simple procedure, nothing to worry about dura, nothing to worry about managers. Just only thing is you have to enter into the cardiac epidural space. Again, the uh, disadvantage is, so you can't do it for any pathology at the level of L4 and above. For example, you should not do it for L3 and L4 because we can't inject that much volume to reach L3, L4. So because the sacral canal is the least resistant structure, so even if you start injecting, it can accommodate 20 to 30 ml. Sacral canal itself can accommodate 20 to 30 ml. It's very difficult to inject that much volume to reach L3, L4. But still, it can be tried. If you're not able to do interlaminar, if the patient is not willing for interlaminar, then you can try or you can put a RAX catheter or you can, there are some Korean catheters where you can navigate, just go there and inject there. Second thing is, though I say this is the most commonly done procedure, we usually do it at the patient's above 60 years, right? 60, 70, sometimes 80 years with scanner stenosis. Those patients will have calcified sacrococcygeal ligament and sometimes there will be osteophytes. It will be very difficult. It's not that much easy as doing interlaminar. Interlaminar, just we have to go hit the lamina, just move it up. Or you can go in the midline, just feel the uh, your ligament, then you just use the slow technique and go there. Sometimes it will be very difficult when you are doing in aged patients. It's very good in young patients. For example, if the patient is coming for discogenic pain, cardiac epidural steroid, I think it's very easy because it's just a matter of minutes will just come out of the procedure. Third thing is, is sacral canal is highly vascular. So even if you are just going at keeping at the needle of S3, aspirating of Nothing coming up doesn't mean it's intravascular. I had seen it very frequently in my practice. Okay, If I aspirate, nothing comes off. If I inject contrast, you can see the drugs nicely spreading in the venues. Right? So there is more than 30% chance of keeping it intravascular. Again, I already told it's a it's a big canal, right? So you need more volume. For example, you are doing interlaminar, you need maybe hardly four to six ml. For example, if it is L4, L5, just put your needle at the L4, L5, just four to five ml is good enough for those pathologies. But for example, if the same structure, same pathology, if you're doing by caudal, you need minimum at least six to eight ml. So it slightly needs more volume. So more volume means you are going to dilute it more. Second thing you have to, you are adding more local. 
So unless we are just going off, it's not clinically so significant, but still, if the patient already has some multiple canal stenosis, you are just going on increasing the volume, it may aggravate. Okay. So caudal is again, we'll go for caudal. It's you no need of special needles, no need of worry about dural puncture, right? Coming to the internal lamina. It's the very commonly done by anesthesiologists. Yes. Most of anesthesiologists is very expert on doing this. The main advantage of interlaminar epidural is you can do it in any position except supine position, right? So you can do it in prone position, lateral, and sitting position. So those patients who are not able to sit, uh, lie, you can make them to get it a sit, and you can do the procedures. It can be done for any level pathology. Nothing level doesn't matter. Even if it is L3, L4, L2, L2, L3, you can do it off. And one more thing is you need an LOR technique, right? So we can't just go like card label, just go and keep it there. You can't, for example, you can't keep it in lateral view, just cross the lamina, you will get able. No, you need an LOR technique. The disadvantage of is. So we always should be very careful. Whenever we are going to use a bigger needle, the epidural hematoma chances are more with this interlamina. So you always should be aware. For example, I had told you in any level you can do it off. Yes, you can do it off with CM guidance or with ultrasound. But only thing you should be aware of normal card enlargement. You can't do it in yellow and two. If you you can do it, nothing wrong. But only thing you should be very careful. So in case of cervical region, you should be very careful. In case of thoracic region, again you should be very careful because there the epidural spaces are very less. Okay, we should be very careful in moving those structures. Again, even though we are using a lower technique, there may be a minimal chance of dual puncture. Okay, if you are injecting a drug, in spite of injecting the epidural space, if you inject anything in the arachnoid space, it's going to be nightmare for the patient. It will cause severe arachnoid disease. Okay, so again. For example, I already told you the patient has got L4, L5 canal stenosis. You are going to inject at the level of L4, L5. There may be a chance you may aggravate. Okay. So these are the, I can say these are the indications that it has got, it's a negative recommendation. You are not supposed to do that. For example, if the patient got L4, L5, just do it on the lower level. But only thing you should identify the level normally. Just palpatory method it's, it itself is not adequate. You have to use at least ultrasound or CR machine to locate that level. Right. So this is about the interlaminar transforminal. Yeah, it's the procedure we usually do it for radiculopathy, right? Those patients who has got uh, radiculopathy symptoms, it's have more diagnostically. The caudal and interlamina, they are more of therapeutic. Just we'll go put steroids and come out. Here, we can do local anesthetic and check out whether the patient has got the same radiculopathy. For example, if we are clinically, I'm saying it is L4 radiculopathy. If I put local around L4, the patient should have pain relief. This is the most, most confirmatory test for pain symptoms, okay? So MRA and CT are not going to help. It's just going, it's not the confirmatory test. It just gives you a clue about the patient's disease. So it is the diagnostic value it is going to help. Uh, you need less volume for those patients. Uh, if, for example, you need two to three ml for transforaminal. And if you have started doing transforaminal frequently, you, you, you may do advanced procedures like DRG and endoscopic discectomy. For example, if you start doing transforaminal, if your skills goes on increasing, then you may you may advance yourself to endoscopic discectomy. Again, the disadvantage is don't do transforaminal above L2. You can do it at the level of L3, L4, L5, S1, S2, but don't do anything above L2 because we had got major artery like artery of Adams case or any segmental feeding artery if you injure it, it's going to compromise on the patient's life, right? So don't do above L2. There are some people who say that, okay, you can do it. You can do it with ultrasound, then you can uh, confirm with CM. Yes, this is for those patients who are those persons who are practicing for years. Those have got good skill needling, but it is not advisable for those who are going to start their practice or those who are in the young stage of your practice. Again, you can't do any transformer just by blind technique. Just you can't you can't do it like go and hit the articular pillar, walk it down. Don't do it off. You always have to do it with either ultrasound or CR machine. CR machine is always the better than ultrasound machine. So you have to do it with ultrasound, CR machine. Okay. Again, just a summary of technique. So for cardinal. It is the most commonly done by pain physicians. You have to do it for any pathology below L4. We don't need any special needles or any syringes. And we need CR machine with contrast control, right? For interlaminar, you can do it for any pathology above L4. Even though we can do it with a low technique, the ideal thing is always use CR machine 
and contrast control. So I'm just saying contrast control. Contrast control means before you inject any epidural steroids, it's mandatory. Okay, just like that, you are just going and getting a loss of resistance, and you just you can't just inject steroid. Okay, you have to confirm. So without confirming with contrast injections, don't don't do epidural steroids, right? If it is intravenous, it's okay. The patient is saved. If it is intra-arterial. So the patient life is going to be horrible for the life. Okay, right? So transforminal, we always do it for radiculopathy. For example, the patient has got radiculopathy. The first option will be transforminal than cut, right? So these are the steroids. We routinely use it in our practice, right? So in India, we had got uh, these four, five drugs. Hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, tramsolone, betamethasone, and dexamethasone. These are the steroids we have in our practice. So mostly, if you ask in pain vision, which is the steroid we use, so most of us we say methylprednisolone. Okay. So I don't know the reason behind it, but most of us are trained in that way. But if you ask an orthopedician and neurosurgeon, they will be saying tramsulin, right? But just understand there is no difference between these two drugs. But the only theoretical possibility is it has got some sodium retention capacity. Other than that, it's almost both are equal. There is a lot of debate between methylprednisolone and dexamethasone. Which one will be the better? That will be coming off slowly, right? So these are the particle sizes. So when you look at this, uh, there are if you if you are if you are not worried, we, we don't know what what form of drug. So only thing you have to see what is that methylprednisolone, acetate, astonite. Those are will be in a suspension form. So for example, if the if the drug is in phosphate, so those will be water soluble. That will be very clear. If anything in acetate, astonite, it will be suspension form. Okay, most of us will be using this truck. So we, most of you know this brand Epimetal. Nowadays in India, it is not available. It has been stopped for long back, almost three, four years. We had got only two companies in India. We are supplying method production of the two in suspension form. So there we 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 are we are not sure what was the compound because when you look at depot metal they had got a lot of preservatives like poly polyethylene glycol polysorbate these benzyl alcohol but in indian the, the drugs which are nowadays available in india don't have these precipit uh, we, we don't have these uh, additives i don't know why they just write it is methylprednisolone and water so i don't know what were they whether they have it or not so what is the importance of these additives this may be the important thing for your allergic reaction. So whatever the compound we have here, they may be the responsible thing for allergic reactions. So usually steroids is a drug of choice for your anaphylaxis or allergic reaction, but sometimes even these drugs can cause allergic reactions. It may be because of these additives, right? Um, just this is about the steroids we are uh, using. So we are coming for the discussion of the most important thing. When we had started practicing pain management, I think it is 1990s to 2000, I think most uh, the young first generation pain physicians started up, uh, st started practicing in India. Then we had got generations coming up, learning a lot of things. In 2014, I think the, it was at the time where we are talking more on pain, pain, pain. In 2014, the FDA has issued a letter that injection of corticosteroids in the epidural space of the spine may result in rare. But serious adverse events, including loss of vision, stroke, paralysis, and death, it's available in online nurse. Okay. So nowadays we are living in online era, right? So most of the patients, if they're advising steroids, they will just go and Google it up and they will come back, sir. FDA has given this warning. What should, what what can be done? Okay. So I think this was one of the uh, most important uh, hindrance for progress of pain medicine. Then a the lot of debates came, a lot of articles came back. There are a lot of debates. Then still FDA has not removed that uh, epidural steroid. Epidural steroid can be used. They don't say don't use it off, but it is an off-label use. It's not for, uh, it's not labeled for, uh, for example, Depometer is not labeled for epidural space. I still remember the Depometer by Pfizer, they used to have a warning in it, not for epidural injection. Though we use it for epidural, if you read the pamphlet inside, it has the word that not for epidural. Nowadays, in Indian Indian drugs don't have that uh, marking, but Depomodal by Pfizer has got that warning. So then we had a lot of discussions. Why we, why why this happened? Why these things are happened? There are a lot of debates going on. Then they found out, okay, it's uh, again, the, the, the debate is FDA don't have any rights to say this procedure does, should not be done because they don't have control over any procedures. They have control over food and drugs, nothing more than that. So they're told you have you should not do epidural steroid injection because it harms more. 
then the studies came back and told that okay it is not the epidural steroid it is a technique now most of the complications which are causing is not because of this steroid it is because of the wrong technique so it, most of them are done blindly second thing it is done transformally so without injecting contrast without image guidance if you are doing especially in the cervical region though we can say uh, you are just uh, without contrast injection you are injecting with just by ultrasound machine then there may be a chance of all these things okay so now they had told okay fine you can do it but do it with image guidance so that was the inference at last again there was a debate between okay why why you are why to use uh, suspension form use water soluble right so nowadays there are a lot of studies saying that okay in spite of using methylprednisone or depot form use dexamethasone the results are okay are comparable so there is no there is significant uh, we can say it also produce significant pain relief but again those who are already practicing in pain management are very comfortable with the post steroids. I think it was most of your theoretical value. They say, okay, at least it will stay there for three weeks and they will have a better results. But there are still a lot of articles coming out with water soluble. Again, we'll go for side effects. Once FDA has issued it, so now we start with uh, why FDA has given these things. Okay, most of the side effects are because of procedure. Okay, so what are the procedure complications? If you look at this, this is the whole list in 10,000 patients, okay, it's a significant number. It was it was even given before FDA's one. It was done in 2012, okay. The, this the article has been done in 2012. FDA given in 2014, then 2015 multitask workforce. Everything has started discussing those things. But if you look at these complications, okay, the most common thing will be your bleeding. It's not because of drug. It's because of the procedure, because we are using a bigger needle. For example, if you use a small needle, if you are using 20 to 23 grudge, you may not cause. But here, in mostly with the interlaminar epidural, we have to suppose to use a bigger needle. For example, you have to use 16 grudge or 18 grudge. 20 grudge will be very small. We can't reach it off. Even if you are doing, for example, if you are doing the same patient with sitting with a lot of technique, you may reach the epidural space in four centimeters. The same patient in prone patient with CR machine, you may reach it in six to eight, seven centimeter because you are you are going to the because of the lardosis. It's very difficult to correct the lardosis with the prone position. So again, we have to use a long needle and a bigger needle. So the most common complication for inter epidural steroid is bleeding. Nothing more than that, right? So the remaining thing like infection abscess, it's almost literally zero. So it's not more invasive procedures. We are always worried about infection in few patients like those patients who has got uncontrolled diarrhea or immunosuppressed. So these are the patients who are we are always worried about. Again, uh, we never give antibiotics for those patients who are uh, undergoing for any in intervention other than like trigeminal where you are uh, touched dura. Other than that, we never give antibiotics. But we specifically give antibiotics for patients like those who are uncontrolled diabetes, for example, who has got uh, always blood sugar about 200 immunosuppressed patients, those patients who are on immunosuppressant drugs, or uh, those patients retroviral positive, then we give antibiotics. So even though I say we can give antibiotics, there's still the scientific reason behind it. It's for our personal safety, nothing more than that, right? Then, so we had got few other side effects because of the drugs. One is allergic reaction, I had told, mostly is because of the additives, immune suppression. Right. So if you are giving a steroid, we always worried about, okay, if you give some injection, what will happen to the in immunity? So it has been shown, even those patients who are undergoing like a shoulder intraarticular injection, always defer any major surgery at least for six weeks. Right. So for example, if the patient has undergone intraarticular steroid, don't go for laparotomy. Okay, you have to wait at least for six weeks. Or we can put it in the vice versa. If the patient is going to undergo any major surgeries, don't do any steroid injections. Again, the third thing is hyperglycemia. Those patients who are diabetic, we always worry about you are giving a steroid. What will happen to the blood sugar? Just relax, nothing will happen. So usually the blood sugar elevates slightly on the second day to sixth day, but I had seen not that much significant. So I always have the habit of seeing blood sugar on day three. I just ask the patient to do blood sugar, the fasting blood sugar on the day three. Most of the time it won't that much, it won't fluctuate that much. Even those patients who are elevated usually comes back in six days, right? 
The fourth thing is bone demineralization. So if you are, again, we can say the, if you're injecting in the tendon, they say it will get weakened. What will happen if you're injecting in the spine? What will happen to the bone strength? Yes. If you're injecting in epidural steroid, your fracture sites, your fracture chances goes up by 31%. Okay. So, but still there are articles says that even with three injections, the osteoporotic chances are very less. There are some articles says no, even with single injection, you can, it, it can go up by 31%. I will say, epidural steroid, yes, be careful, those patients, when you are injecting in an old age patient. So in any patient, okay, it's not a big issue, but in case of old age patients, always be careful. It's, it's, it's relatively less when you are doing epidural steroid, but still there is a chance of vertebral weakening and vertebral fractures, right? The last thing is HPA suppression. We always talk about this HPA suppression, how much... Uh, how much dose we can give without HPA suppression. Everybody knows it's 5 milligram methyl uh, prednisolone and more can cause HPA suppression. If you look at this slide, you can understand this one. So if you are giving methyl prednisolone, the average H, uh, suppression will be with single injection will be one to three weeks. Sometimes it can extend for months. So the most commonly done will be for methyl prednisolone, but we don't have data at present for dexamethasone. But still, Mostly we do with methyl prednisolone. It's average will last for three weeks. Suppression will be there for three weeks. What is that? What is the advantage of why we are worrying about HPA suppression? It's not that much uh, in a normal life. It's not that much important. But those patients who are going for some stress like fever, or uh, those patients who have got some infection, so those patients who are going for surgery, there we should always supplement. So that's the most important thing we are worried about the HPA. But uh, we always say, if you are giving a single shot of epidural steroid, it obviously lasts for three weeks, right? But you are going for multiple, it may last for months. It can last for three to six months, right? Okay, what is the recommendation? Present recommendation for epidural steroid. So those, I, can, I had seen a lot of people who are doing uh, pain practice. They always have the, for example, the patient has got PAVDL for L5S1 with uh, L5 radiculopathy. What they do, they do carlipidus steroid, then they put root block. Okay, it's not advised. Okay, if you want to do procedure, do only one procedure. Either do caudal or do transform. Or you want to do interlaminar, do interlaminar. Again, interlaminar, for example, the patient has got multiple disc bulge. You can't just put one at the L4, L5. Again, you can not put it in L3, L4. If you want to put, you have to put it at only one level. And if you are going for transforaminal, you can do it at the maximum of two levels. For example, you are going for bilateral, you have to do it at the level of one level. For example, L4, L5 means bilateral L4, L5, you have to do it once. Again, if you are injecting transforaminal injections, you are not supposed to inject more. For example, there are some intention of, okay, let me put it in the L4 and I will try to put 4 to 5 ml, it will go up. You should not do it off. Okay. So you have to maximum inject around 2 ml. So can we repeat the steroid injection for those patients? Yes. There is, you can't get 100% results in most of the patients, right? Again, there is again a debate whether it's going to respond or not. Even if you get, doesn't mean you will get 100% pain relief. So we we have, there are a lot of societies comes up with the different algorithms. So, okay, do it at six weeks, do it with uh, three months, three, two weeks, like that. There are a lot of things going on. But just from the pharmacokinetic, for example, we are using methylprednisone, it says that uh, we always say that, okay, if you are injecting methylprednisone in report form, it stays for three weeks. So our practice is just we repeat injection every third weekly. We never make it as a mandatory injection. We just inject the patient, just ask the patient to come back after three weeks and see how much is the pain relief. If the patient says I'm having 80 to 90% pain relief, that means it's okay. Don't do anything. Don't do any intervention. Just leave the put the patient on physical therapy and get back the patient. If the patient says I'm having 50%, then I may repeat the injection. I repeat with half the dose. For example, I injected 40 milligram of depotsteroid or depomedrol. Then I will be injecting 20 milligram of depomedrol. You have to put those, you have to half the dose because we should be very careful in putting the amount of steroids also. Again, and I reevaluate re the patient after three weeks, then I will see how the pain relief was. Again, if the patient says, I had got real uh, improvement, but still I'm not getting 80 to 90 percent, then I will repeat it off. The recommendation in most of the books says you can go up to five injections, right? Uh, some books say it's six injections in an one year duration. But I, in Indian practice, I think we, as a group trained in, trained under the, 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 we always say, 
don't go more than three injections, okay? So three injections is the maximum injections we usually routinely go for. Uh, and again, for example, the patient, you did three injections, again, the patients come back after eight months and says, I want injection. Again, don't just go directly for epidural steroid. Re-evaluate the patient. If this is the same pain, again, you have you have to again put the patient again on conservative. If the patient is not responding, then you can go for this epidural steroid injection. Again, the debate is whether I get to go for depot or soluble. Yes, for lumbar regions, sacral regions, you can go for depot steroid, but make sure you are doing with ultrasound or CM machine with contrast control. If you are doing it blindly, don't use depotmetrols or depot steroids. Use dexamethasone. That's more than enough. You have to inject 4 milligrams of dexamethasone. If you want to inject local, that's up to you. So uh, inject, adding local in epidural steroid injection is not going to have a significant difference for the patient. It's just a matter of few minutes to hours. So nothing significant. Just you can just go for dexamethasone. Again, the debate is whether to go for blind or image guidance. 100% you have to go with image guidance. Again, the debate is whether it's the CM or ultrasound. I will say if you are going for spine pathology, CM is the best. Okay. One thing is even with ultrasound, you need CM machine as your partner. For example, if you are keeping your needle under ultrasound guidance in the epidural space and uh, before you inject, you need a contrast injection. The combined technique is always the best because the we are, when you are using CM machine, the radiation hazard is always there. There you can use ultrasound machine to keep the needle at end portion. Then you confirm with CM machine. That's the best way to do it off. So how much dose we can give? There are a lot of recommendations, but uh, from Manchikanti, it was three milligram per kilogram of any steroid. Okay. Or it is two, 10 milligram per year or 420 milligram per lifetime. But I don't know what was the scientific basis it basis for this recommendation, but this is a recommendation. I don't, I don't really don't have any reason for it, but I found that most probably because uh, if you increase this dose, there may be a chance of HPA suppression. That may be the un one reason I just found out. Uh, again, the textbook itself mentioned this word and they will say without scientific evidence. I don't know why, but this was the recommendation. We, uh, I don't know the reason behind it. Still, I follow this. So 210 milligram is significant. For example, you are using 5 ml of uh, Depot steroid, like methylprednisone, that is 5 ml. That's good enough for your patient, right? Again, the frequency I had told, there are a lot of debates from different societies, different uh, protocols, but we always say go for three injections in three weeks difference. That's good enough. That's, that's I can say that that makes sense for an Indian patient, right? And again, there are some people who do every week, like especially in the Korean society, if you are going for Korean people who are doing intervention there, you can say they do it very frequently, every weekly. Uh, that's not recommended. You just you you can't do the procedures which has got some complications which can patient can have. You should not do it. Off. You have to wait for the drug to act. At least two weeks is required for steroid to act. So you have to wait at least two weeks. So we keep it as three weeks because we expect that the port steroid will stay for three weeks and that was the maximum duration that it can work. Right? There are different recommendations. When you look at the recommendations from different societies you can see what is the medical politics, okay? Those recommendations by physician societies always says Ebulosius works too good for short term and long term. Those for a physician society, they always say, don't do it. It has got complications, don't do, don't do. So I don't know what was the basic behind these societies just fighting among each other saying this is best, this is best. And I will share, okay, it's, it's, it's the person who does and recommends that's good. If physicians don't do those, they just take up the literature, just review the article and do it all. If pain physician does it and he sees the patients and he, he is the best, better expert than a physician group, right? So I always follow this society groups. And if you look at the neurosurgeons, they will say, yes, you can try conservative and you can try and explain the patient. That's very important that they, they used to say, explain the patient and do it all. So I will say April steroid is good for patients if you select it properly, right? So how to select the patient? That's the main important thing, right? For the patients who are having acute radiculopathy, yes, it will work. So how much, you, uh, how much time you have to wait for conservative? I will say you have to wait at least for six weeks. Okay, just you can't put a, for a patient having pain for one week, patient saying, I am I am not able to do any activities, don't do it, right? Wait, 
this is the disease itself the our body itself will defend our disease right so give some time for the disease to act uh, our body to defend you have to wait at least for six weeks sometimes if the patient comes to me in one week i wait for another one week, at least for two weeks so you have to that is a minimum period you have to wait so you have to wait for two weeks and see how the patient is if the patient says i am having pain relief but not that much significant then also you can wait for six weeks if, the, if your patient says I am getting it more and more aggravated. Then you can try for this. Right? So this was one of the words given in uh, this insurance company, the Medicare Services of USA. They say they have an article for epidural recommendation. They say there are different articles and we are finding it difficult because it's like in comparing an apple to an orange. There is no standard protocol in any of these articles. They will say they, they, they use different compounds, they use different techniques, they use it for different indications. Sometimes there won't be non-specific indication. It's very difficult to compare all these articles. There are a lot of uh, articles in, if you search out, you, there will be a lot of articles for uh, epidural steroids that some people will say it's work some people will say it won't work then you have to rely on some society to come up with systemic analysis and come out what will be the recommendation they found it is very difficult to recommend because the articles are not not great they will say there are different RCTs with the different techniques it's very difficult but still most of the societies accept that okay epidural steroid will give some short-term pain relief for example the patient is having pain for six weeks and if you give it it will at least give relief for three months to six months. This is the most commonly uh, used words. But is it very significant? Yes, it's very significant. If you are suffering from radical, then you can understand what is the significance of this short term. Okay. Our body itself will differ. For example, if you are have, you are giving analgesics, six, you are getting pain relief. After three weeks, your body will get itself tuned or they will defend itself and make you pain free. So if your drugs are not responding, you have to give some more chances for your body to uh, get it defended. So if you're giving an epidural steroid and the patient says, okay, I'm getting pain relief, then our body itself will take care and they will have sometimes long-term pain relief. They will have pain relief for long term. So what is the common things uh, we do? We take a patient of pain with 10 years and we do epidural steroid and we expect patients should have pain relief for years. It's very difficult, right? So because most of the time, it is not a nociceptive pain, it will be a neuropathic pain. So it is very difficult just putting an epidural steroid in a neuropathic pain and you're expecting the patient should have a pain relief. Yes, I had a last, last week, I had a patient who was suffering from back pain for the past 10 years. It's typically a neuropathic pain. I told them, okay, you have tried everything. He has been tried even alternative medicine, even massage therapies, everything she tried. I, she came back to me and told, okay, I'm suffering for years. I need some relief. I told them, okay, I can break your pain cycle, but I don't know whether it's going to respond for years. I just gave a shot of able to to the miracle. It, she has got very good pain relief. And again, I just say, this is case of exception. Okay, don't don't believe, for example, you are doing some cases with three patients, four patients with chronic pain for six years to 10 years and you get good results doesn't mean it's it's works. It's a, it's a drug which is, has a miraculous activities. No, it won't have that much miraculous. It do some work in some patients, but most of the time these patients, they, are, they, they used to come back after months. Okay, so they will still have for those patients with chronic pain, if you are doing epidural steroid injection, you just make sure to the patient you are just going to break the pain cycle and it is not going to give you relief for some months, two years, something like your lifetime. Only the physical therapy which is going to help you. Again, those patients with neuropathic pain, epidural steroid is just a part. It's a small part of your management. It's the physical therapy which is going to be the major thing which is going to help the patient. Again, if you're going for a steroid injection, always discuss with the patient. Just don't give false belief that if you're having radical epithy, if I put steroid, you will get magic relief. Don't give this false belief. Just explain the patient, right? So these are the things which can, you are for example, I will give you a steroid for you because if the drug has failed for the last six weeks, I will give you a steroid injection. May It may help, right? So I have to wait for at least for one week for the onset, at least two weeks to infer whether it's worked and three weeks to repeat. So this is the words we routinely use it off. So after three weeks, if I assess the patient, if the patient says pain relief, yes, good, you have got the good relief, but only thing, it's not going to sustain just by injection. You have to go for physical therapy. If the patient don't go physical therapy, again, it may be a chance that they will come back after a few weeks and they will say, sir, I got the same pain. So if you want the sustained pain relief, it's not the epidural steroid. Epidural pain steroid is just for breaking the pain cycle, right?
just coming for the last slide epidural steroid injection if you are doing in your practice make sure you are doing it as an expert mode so you know why you are doing it what was the indication is the diagnosis is right or not if somebody is referred to you and make sure that's the same diagnosis so just don't do it like in technician mode just send somebody some technique some some department sending the patient for epidural steroid just going and putting it don't help that much okay because there is a more chance you you first thing you you won't learn okay why you are doing what was the results you won't learn it off so don't do any epidural steroid as a technician mode always do it as an expert mode we had got the expertise only thing you have to read you have to learn you have to learn something beyond anesthesia again if you are doing epidural steroid don't do it blindly okay i had seen a lot of people is doing blindly it's not because of uh, there's a problem because they don't have cm machines so they don't have access to cm machines but start learning with image gainers or if you nowadays we had got a lot of ultrasound machines right so at least try to put it with ultrasound machine but if you have a chance to have a cm machine that's too good and again always inject contrast so again there is a debate which contrast to use most of the otis will have urographin right so don't inject urographin so you have to inject water soluble omna pack or ultra vis there are a lot of water soluble contrast don't you inject urographin if you are going to compromise on patient's life right again if our lumbosacral regions yes you can use diporsteroid in thoracic and cervical water soluble that's a good option but if you are going to start your practice use only water soluble it's it's always have the same almost equal in results like a depot steroid so use water soluble and don't do transforminal evo l2 even i will say even with expert hands there is a chance of injuring your segmental artery okay so don't do anything evo l2 so you, if you have if you are doing in a patient and you are getting results that's good enough you are too good but if you have a complication you can't defend because the textbook says don't do evo l2 it has got recommended uh, negative recommendation but by, by multiple societies so it's easy to just point out okay this has got a recommended negative recommendation why did it right so don't do evo l2 and if you are doing by transforaminal you have heard of cambin strangle right so cambin strangle is the safest strangle it's not the safe triangle that's a particular which is not the safe triangle cambin strangle is the safest triangle to do with and i will say if you want to do epidural steroid do it intralaminal as you are doing but always use a cm machine but you want to be more if you want to be more expertized start doing caudal epidural and cm guidance do it off and you are expert in caudal and intralaminal start learning transforaminal okay so do transforaminal those patients who has got radiculopathy just for discogenic pain don't for just clean just for if the patient has only back pain don't do transforaminal do only intralaminal and cut if the patient has got radiculopathy do transforaminal and thank you the team so any questions i am here to take your questions ah uh, thanks guru thanks uh, it's a very excellent presentation uh, right from the basics to the uh, current concepts you have explained the things very well uh, how you know, some queries but some of the queries are yes, already you have, you have already uh, answered for other uh, queries uh okay, but, but i see <laughs> i actually i just want to ask you one thing you you emphasize that uh, you love to do it with spinal needle rather than epidural needle for uh, for caudal i prefer caudal i i always use venfron steroid so if you are using spinal needle the stiffness won't be that much if you are using 22 gauge it will be stiffness won't be that much i use 18 gauge venfron steroid so the stiffness will be good again it has got a lateral eye so even if you are injecting if there is something resistance there it will take out from lateral line okay uh, see actually uh, can i make a small uh, comment on your uh, this thing you told that combining ultrasound and uh, fluoroscopy is best but i i i i i, I want yeah. you to tell it's a must it, it, it's a must so even even when okay, you, you are saying it's a must Uh, even if you do it under uh, yeah. ultrasound, the fluoroscopy check, contrast check is uh, must in epidural injection because I, you only told that even yes, in caudal, I've seen lot of uh, lot of the times it has gone into the uh, this thing, uh, venous plexus and other things. So, so, uh, so uh, when you do ultrasound guided uh, injections, uh, 
um you you prefer a lumbar transforaminal better under ultrasound or fluoroscopy if you have uh, if you are being given a chance so so i always spine means my first option other than si joint and the s1 root block my first option I, s1 i will try with ultrasound uh, i because it's very easy to do and in transforaminal i always in lumbar region i always very comfortable with the cr machine maybe i think if i start using it maybe i will be comfortable with the ultrasound but i always feel cr machine is better for uh, lumbar procedures but there are experts who do uh, transforaminal with ultrasound uh but as per my experience i will say cm is the best uh so uh, you, you mentioned about the cambin triangle and subpedicular approach for uh, this yeah. thing can you emphasize why yeah. why you want to prefer cambin triangle always okay so just i just i think i missed that presentation slide right i just uh, yeah no you so if you look look at this one this slide right so this is your transforamen you had got uh, now we are if you say this is you divide this one into three structures upper one third middle and lower one third okay if you divide from cranial to caudal you can make it is one third two third three three so you can make it is three three we can split it in three the upper one third which we do it in subpedicular approach just below the pedicle if you just go we inject right that was the classic approach we do it they say safe triangle approach subpedicular approach usually we say it's safe but there is a chance it may get some veins there so usually it will get some veins sometimes you will get a segmental artery there so that's not a safe triangle but if you are going below here for lower one third there you won't get any veins any artery that's why we say cambin triangle is very safe the only thing if you are doing for subpedicular and cambins is for example you are doing for cambins for example the patient has, if, if we say this is l4 and this is l5 this is l4 l5 disc bulge and you are doing by cambin triangle be careful you are just going exactly at the pathology site right so if you are just going and exactly at the pathology site you should not use more volume you have to inject very less volume 1.1 to 1.5 ml is more than adequate again you are just going to inject exactly at the pathology site that you can expect the drug to be more effective for example if i am injecting in subpedicular for example for example the patient has got radiculopathy here i had to inject from down and i had to push the drug up okay so that was the again another advantage of cambin string cambin string advantage is we don't have any vessels there in cambin string that is lower one third second thing is we are just going to inject exactly at the pathology site so you need less volume and better action for the drugs it's more of theoretical i will say the better action is more theoretical but i always say it's always try the best theoretical thing uh if the patient has come up with a post laminectomy syndrome with instruments in situ uh okay. which route you with, with which instruments in situ particular instruments so yeah. what route you okay. prefer for the that type of patients like yeah. so mostly those patients who has got a, a pale back so if you are saying post laminectomy with the instrumentation i always prefer we go for caudal epidural so that will be the best thing to do for her. so if you want me to for example patient is having typical radiculopathy yes i can try transforaminal but it instrument is not a big issue sir whenever you are having an cr machine you can change the angles different way angles and you can find the space but again i will try cambins then uh so now when uh, i stopped doing safe triangle approach i am started doing only cambins triangle i think for the past 6 7 okay. months uh vishnu vishnu has made a comment that uh, ultrasound will confirm the needle position no the issue is not with the needle position vishnu when you do a caudal uh, the, the, you start losing the visualizing the needle after you enter into the bone because bone window will obstruct the needle uh, visualization in ultrasound that's why i i i emphasize that always uh, it should be hybrid and fluoroscopy with dye after that you can inject the right okay yeah uh, ultrasound yeah, yeah, yes, is a good thing ultrasound is a good thing yeah there is a lot of debates going on but again as rajesh told i i just i told the same thing only you have to inject contrast so yeah. contrast plays a major role there is no contrast for ultrasound at present only the air bubbles are the only thing which you can use it as then contrast and again there are some people says okay you inject start seeing something on the interlaminar window those are i think it's very technically difficult to do those things better you just go for a single set of steroid yes you can do those techniques for those who are allergic to contrast 
there are some indications like the patient is uh, you can't use cm machine you can't use contrast those kinds of like pregnancy there you can use those techniques uh, uh, can you emphasize on the volume how much volume you use so you told 2 ml for uh, transforaminal how much for interlaminar how much for uh, caudal epidural so i always use 6 to 8 ml so usually i decide when i inject contrast so i never premeditate that this much ml i will give so what i do i just put it on the needle at the s to S3 level, I inject contrast. So usually my contrast will be 1 to 2 ml and how see how much it is going up. Okay. So if the 1 to 2 ml, for example, 2 ml, it is reaching L5, I hardly need 6 ml. That's more than enough. Because with 2 ml, it is able to reach, means I need hardly 6 ml. In enter laminar, I used to use 4 to 6 ml because we can say 1 or 2 segments. Usually they say 2 ml per segment. So 4 to 6 ml I use depending on the patient's condition. Okay, the patient has got 2 3 levels. I will use it around 6 to 8 ml. If it is 2 level, I use it 6 ml. If it is single level, I use it around 4 ml. That's for uh, added advantage that even something goes. Uh, outside the epidural, at least some drugs will go there. So I used to give 4 ml. For caudal, I always inject contrast and see how much I need. So most of the time, I won't be injecting more than 8 ml. That's the most important thing. Second thing is, uh, very important thing when you're doing caudal, the how much rapid you are giving. Okay, there is always a chance if you just go, when you're like an anesthesia, you're just giving drug fast within 10 seconds, you may create headache for the patient. The patient may say, I'm having headache. Okay, so don't inject anything fast in caudal or interlaminar. You have to inject 2 ml fast, wait for 3 to 4 seconds, inject 2 ml, wait again for 3 to 4 seconds, inject. You have to inject either in increments or you have to give it very slowly over 1 to 2 minutes. That's the most important thing. If you are giving over 1 to 3, 2 minutes, I think it, you, you find something, you are feeling like your oh, drug won't reach there because I am giving it very slowly. The drug will try to accumulate only in the sacral canal, but you are giving it very fast. For example, I just push it in one second, the drug moves fast. At least it will reach in L4, L5 level easily. So that's why we give it fast, 2 ml fast, wait for a few seconds. Again, give 2 ml, wait for a few seconds. Again, in increments, you have to give. Uh, if there is an inadvertent dural puncture happening during your uh, interlaminar epidural steroid attempt, uh, if you have injected steroids, what will happen or what will you do if you have an in inodermal dural puncture? So inodermal dural puncture is, I told you, now, if something, the drugs which we are routinely using that uh, methyl is a deport steroids, right? So they which has got a lot of preservatives. If you are injecting there, there may be a chance of chemical arachnoiditis. If you are inwardly injected, means I will say you have to pray that's all. Or otherwise, if you say you are damn sure that you are injected, there are some people say put in catheter, you wash, take off, okay. take off the drug, give wash and take it off. But I have never tried so far because I don't have that much experience so far in my life. Thanks God, this is why I didn't have. But I will say if you are not supposed to inject anything in subarachnoid, that's the most important thing. You should be very careful. That's why I say inject contrast, contrast, contrast because it helps you in the diagnosis whether it's intravascular or intrathecal. So then you inject off. So I will say, ah. even if you inject it, you put a catheter, a brutal catheter inside the spinal canal, just get use uh, saline and get it washed off. Uh, incidence of epidural abscess following your uh, epidural steroid injection? Uh, so far, it's zero. I think I had shown the uh, previous uh, studies also. It was almost zero. Uh, thanks, God. I don't know. Whatever the follow-up I had, I had zero percentage. Okay, uh, I think we have taken up almost all the questions. Uh, our, uh, comment on arachnoiditis has been dealt by Vishnu. Yeah, it is. A, so somebody asked about arachnoiditis and clinical diagnosis of arachnoiditis. Yeah, arachnoiditis, yes. <laughs> the patient will have severe leg pain, especially on the nocturnal pain. They can't uh, lie, they can't move off. They will, this severe neuropathic pain. So it's like every nerve gets clumped off. So then you can expect how much pain it will be. So the patient can't have a particular position to have pain relief. They will have severe pain. They will have severe leg pains and everything will be there. I had okay. seen arachnoiditis in endoscopic discectomy. Okay. okay. Rajesh, can I give an input? Uh, Madam, yes, uh, you are going to you are going to contradict all my versions related to ultrasound. I know no, that no, you are no. going to. Put no, not at all, not uh, at all. Okay, okay, okay. okay. See, okay. Just two minutes. I, I think we are getting. Uh, uh, no, no, related the... uh, related to this topic actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
see thing is like uh, i i feel all uh, spine uh, related uh, transforaminal or caudal uh, there is always a role for fluoroscopy than ultrasound okay that's fine but uh, at the time of needling ultrasound always has a role significant role to play i think we are all talking to uh, uh, people from background of anesthesia so i would personally suggest all your caudal epidurals even in pediatric age group must actually go by ultrasound guidance i think that's the way to start actually doing a spine intervention with ultrasound guidance definitely yes that is a, that's a, that's a most that, most that, 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 nowadays, nowadays i'm very comfortable entering needle with ultrasound yeah so that is I one thing say, no not you not you from the anesthesia no, department no, i'm saying no, no i am saying for those who are already practicing also using ultrasound to enter caudal space is very easy nowadays than by using yeah ultrasound. that is yeah that is number one and probably like uh, you know like uh, uh, i think if you had shown some uh, fluoroscopy images uh, probably like one or two steps for the uh, beginners to learn that would have been better that's okay if you want i can just show yeah one please video. please please one one video small video if you have please oh, it's not it's in the different space. no problem no no worries no worries magnetic neuralysis no. sure no i will just come on my another system i will just join back yeah yeah you can join back because like i, I, I think, think like uh, the youngsters will be inspired by those small little techniques yeah Okay. Uh, shall we move ahead with the next session and then Guru will have the demonstration at the last? Sir, yeah. give me two minutes. I will come back because I had some work there. Can you give me two minutes? Rajesh? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, okay. we can uh, hold on. Don't worry. Yeah. 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 Madan, 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 your, your take on, yeah, I, I do agree that ultrasound, uh, the needle placement will be uh will be better with ultrasound there is no doubt about that but uh i i still feel that for contrast injection and other things no, you, need fluoro. Be, you need fluoro you need fluoro 100% yeah 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 hybrid technique is uh, always uh, better and safe so what is your experience on ultrasound guided transforaminal uh needling which is better with with ultrasound or uh, lumbar transforaminal uh, needling strictly no to ultrasound strictly no to ultrasound okay okay because okay, like because uh, all your all your median branch and facet joints can be done with ultrasound but definitely not transforaminal okay because there are a lot of people those who do uh, ultrasound guided needling uh, but i i uh, i don't advise actually see cadaveric okay. needling practice is different real time live hmm. patient needling is totally different okay okay so we can't take a chance I like that yeah yeah thank thank you thank you because uh, this is a very great message because you are the expert in ultrasound needling so the great message to the See, we, we, that no we really can't say anything on a live patient but with respect to cadaver definitely we can say with respect to the dye spread but i don't really agree with doing sole ultrasound guidance yeah but cervical how, how about cervical cervical cervical, uh, cervical transforaminal you cannot do you can do an extra foraminal injection number 1 Number two, definitely you can do a, a facet, you can do a median branch, you can do a stellate, you can do a cervical plexus. So all that can be done exclusively with ultrasound if you want to really. If you want to have yeah. a hybrid technique, definitely yes, you can do a hybrid. But ultrasound has got a huge role to play with respect to neck procedures. Yeah, ultrasound outroots the uh, fluoroscopy there and... Uh... Absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. You, if you want, you can actually do a hybrid technique. You can do a fluoro confirmation, but not necessarily. Whereas with lumbar spine, you always stand a chance that you will always require a fluoroscopy backup. Plus, there are certain techniques which should never be attempted with sole ultrasound at all. Okay, okay. Uh, Guru, are you ready with your... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is about caudal, right? Okay. <clears throat> so you can see this, this is a lateral sacral spine, right? This is a posterior sacral plate, and this will be your anterior sacral plate. If what you are saying uh, is a sacral uh, canal. Guru, we are not seeing anything. We are not seeing anything. We are not seeing anything. Oh, wait, just. Uh, uh, I think you need to share it yeah. separately. Yeah, I will share it again. Yeah, please. Is 
Yes, sir. Can you see now? Yeah, absolutely. Some... Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is your sacral plate. So anterior sacral plate, posterior sacral plate, you can see the sacral canal. <clears throat> So we had to just infiltrate local. So you can see this is the wind front stillet you are using. So you can see the needle over here and we are trying to enter into the sacral canal. The most difficult thing will be here. So if you want to enter here, it's you are done. So you, it's very easy. So you can see this is the AP view. You can see the needle at the level of S3. You can see the contrast. This is called epidurogram. So if you look at here, this patient, you can see the drug is spreading only on one side, especially on the left side, right? So you can see that is some medial plica is there. So now what we am just going to, I will inject some more volume and see whether it's spreading on the opposite side. Again, if you are doing contrast injection, always do it in live mode. Just inject, don't take shot after just injecting. You have to do it in live mode. That's very important thing. So you can see the duct spread. Again, you get a spreader to the opposite side here. So now yeah. I am comfortable, no need to reposition it. Just I will go in again with steroid injection. Okay, this is about steroid. Then I will go for your root. I don't have interlaminar steroid because most of the time I won't be doing interlaminar. Very rarely I will do interlaminar. So this is the root. This video, we had it in our video book. This is the subparticular approach. So this is L5 particle. We are doing with your fellowship candidates. So this video we took it when we are training some fellows. So this was done by my fellow. Only thing you have to hit, hit this pedicle and you have to get down. So just we had hit the pedicle, we are going to get down. So this is a lateral view. This is your pedicle and you are getting our needle here. We have to cross the lamina just at the, we can say posterior, uh, superior one third, we have to keep our needle. Then we have to inject. Again, we have to confirm in AP view, then we'll be injecting contrast. You can see the needle here, almost here. So 
So this is the AP view. You can see the little tip over here. We inject contrast now on live. Now you can see the nerve, exactly the under nerve. Okay. So this is a typical nerve appearance. So once you are confirmed, now you have to go for steroid invasion. Hardly need 0.5 ml. That's more than enough. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks, Guru. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so sorry, okay. I didn't put it because no. I thought of okay, nothing to do with those procedures. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. Uh, okay. Sir Edward, sorry, if there is any other question, shall we move ahead? No, we can move on to the next question. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so the next session is about uh, um, uh, nerve entrapment uh, syndrome. So what is happening new there? And it will be by Dr. Madan Mangala Pandian, a very good friend of mine from my uh, school days. Actually, we both are classmates and uh, and we were batchmates in, uh, actually he was my senior in anesthesiology and uh, so he had done uh, multiple works in this uh, pain related to ultrasound, so sonology and uh, he is having a special uh, degree for that, SIPS, both SIPS and RMSK, so he's an exclusive interventional pain specialist and MSK pain sonologist from uh, Pondicherry, over to you, Madan. Highly, uh, please enlighten us on this topic now. Entrapment syndrome, which is your passion, and I know that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Edward, for the invite. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are, you are, you are clear. My, yeah, my, I think, I think my slides are also seen, right? Uh, slides are quite clear, yes. Uh, I'm basically an anesthesiologist. As Rajesh introduced me, I'm basically an anesthesiologist. Pain has actually uh, really evolved. The, the, the department, the speciality of pain medicine has really evolved and it has got multiple domains. I have taken up one such domain called musculoskeletal ultrasound and pain medicine, where the common problems of pain medicine actually comes from the musculoskeletal system. And out of these musculoskeletal system, there are some things which are very, very difficult to diagnose and treat. Once we make a diagnosis, I think like there is always a saying, you make the diagnosis, then it is very easy to treat. So nerve entrapment syndromes are the ones which are the most difficult ones to diagnose. That is where it becomes difficult to treat as well. So before I actually enter into the topic, I just want to tell you that we have a conference which is coming up. The MSK Pain Congress 2024 in Chennai, that is in Mahabalipuram. Please do register for this conference because this is going to be the benchmark for the future. We have nearly 49 faculty across the globe who are going to enlighten you on this subject of musculoskeletal pain and ultrasound. Okay, someone has time, please go through these procedures, the ultrasound guided interventions, 10 most rewarding procedures. I had a conversation recently with uh, Dr. Hatzik. Uh, we, we discussed about the most rewarding procedures. In those procedures, one of the most important is the nerve-related interventions, that is diagnosis of entrapment syndromes and treatment of entrapment syndromes. So how do we define the terminology? We are not essentially looking at the definition aspect of it. We have something called the structural abnormality of the nerve. There is a structural abnormality of the nerve, either intrinsic or extrinsic, compression, entrapment, or sometimes related to a trauma. The entrapment neuropathies occur within the peripheral nerves, and it is characterized by the distribution of the nerve. That's the one which is affected by the chronic pain. Now, what are the common syndromes? As you all know, the commonest being carpal tunnel syndrome, there is something called cubital tunnel syndrome, that is ulnar nerve entrapment. Then the pin entrapment, that's supposed to interosseous nerve entrapment, Guyon's canal, tarsal tunnel, myralgia parasthetica, which is entrapping the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the Morton's neuroma. Today, I'm going to discuss only about a few syndromes like carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, pin entrapment, and myralgia parasitica because I understand it's a lot difficult to take for particularly postgraduates and beginners in pain medicine. 
So what are the symptoms? There is a localized or a referred pain. Wherever the distribution of the nerve is, there is always some tingling or referred pain-like sensation. There will be a paresthesia, a burning sensation, and impaired movement can be there if it is a long-standing pain. And it can actually result in a myopathy, that is muscle weakness, muscle wasting, and dry, thin skin can be there in chronic cases which develop motor and sensory entrapments. So what are the etiological and risk factors? If there is a trauma, definitely, yes, there is always going to be some little scars, myofascial tension, bony spurs, arthritis, some cysts, systemic diseases like diabetes, acromegaly, hypothyroidism, all this can result in a nerve entrapment syndrome. Because nerve entrapment syndromes are so varied in signs and symptoms, causes and location, it is very, very essential for you to look for the detailed medical history and physical examination before you actually venture into treating the patient. So what are all the differential diagnoses? Sometimes somebody has a pain along the upper limb. It could be just a small little nerve lesion which is causing maybe a tumor, maybe a cyst, maybe a radiculopathy or sometimes a peripheral neuropathy. A peripheral neuropathy is something which is probably not the easiest or not the very difficult ones to diagnose because peripheral neuropathy is going to be uniformly distributed on both the limbs and it is going to be like a glove and stocking fashion. Radiculopathy, you can always find out by doing a provocative test, try to rule out a cervical radiculopathy or a lumbar radiculopathy. Try to see if there are any particular nerve-related distribution causing this particular pain. Now, we move on to a clinical situation where there is a 56-year-old man who is a non-diabetic, a cook by a patient, presenting with two years of history of a right wrist pain along with severe pain of the radial three and a half fingers. So this is the radial three and a half fingers distribution of pain, particularly severe at night, which increases by specific activities like cutting vegetables and making samosas. So what is this particular pain syndrome? Because there is a radial three and a half fingers being involved, you are most likely looking at a patient with carpal tunnel entrapment of the median nerve. So in clinical, on clinical examination, you need to do all these tests, the phalanx, the reverse phalanx, the turcams, the compression test, and the tunnel sign. You could see sometimes in advanced cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, the finger actually, the, this is called the eight thumb deformity because of the weakness of the thinner muscles. So how do you image? Because all your departments of anesthesia and pain medicine has got at least one ultrasound machine at your disposal. Try to look for these musculoskeletal structures whenever you have opportunity to see. You can do a good self-examination. You can try to find out and identify the structures and then go in for intervention and diagnosis on a patient. Exactly, this is what you need to see, the scaphoid and the pisiform on either sides, the scaphoid on the radial side and the pisiform on the medial side. Try to look for the connecting retinaculum, that's the flexor retinaculum, just beneath which you have a bifid median nerve. Here we have a bifid median nerve. One important fact, which I want to really reiterate here is, there is always a learning in undergraduate that this is only an idiopathic syndrome. Never. Around 90% of your patients with carpal tunnel syndrome are either going to have a comorbidity like diabetes or a hypothyroidism or acromegaly, or sometimes they always have a bifid or a trifid median nerve, sometimes a persistent median artery. All these actually are secondary causes of carpal tunnel syndrome. So it is not essentially a primary disease. So you need to rule out, try and treat the primary disease before you actually going for any intervention or surgical procedure. Typically on the long axis examination of the median nerve, you can see there is a compressed median nerve. This is the retinaculum, which is compressing the median nerve, giving rise to an R glass appearance. The proximal and the distal ends little dilated because of venous congestion. So what are all the interventional options? The interventional options are always, you have steroids, 
which has got very limited role to play and a short term very little role to play and a short term role it's probably a matter of one week to 10 days this will act you have got 5% dextrose which can be injected into the carpal tunnel you can put in low doses of botulinum toxin on the proximal end of the muscles that is the tendons the fds and ftp tendons are there within the tunnel you can just proximally inject botulinum toxins around 50 units distributed along these muscles prp injections are very promising suppose if there is a case of severe carpal tunnel syndrome when you actually make a diagnosis with both by ultrasound and nerve conduction studies if it is severe go for percutaneous release techniques exactly for a mild to moderate case which has got a median nerve thickness of less than 18 millimeter square and who has got a mild to moderate severe carpal tunnel syndrome you can go in for a carpal tunnel injection using 5% dextrose i have just demonstrated a technique here this is the medial to lateral needling this is the scaphoid tubercle this is the pisiform ulna artery there and this is the retinaculum. This is the retinaculum under which I'm just injecting 5% dextrose without injuring the nerve and the nerve here. That, and this is the ulnar artery. Ensure that you don't damage any of these vital structures. Try to do a fenestration of this retinaculum. You could see the retinaculum there. Try to do a needle fenestration. I've used a very thin needle, a 26 gauge needle. And on the long axis, this is the long axis of the nerve. Again, injection of 5% dextrose underneath the retinaculum there. That's the retinaculum. And you can see the hydrodisected nerve. This is the nerve which is hydrodisected. And this is the flexor retinaculum. Nicely separated out median nerve means that around 10 ml of 5% dextrose is ejected into the carpal tunnel. Four ml above the nerve on the short axis, four ml below the nerve on the short axis, and two ml above the nerve on the long axis of the nerve. Now, anyone would try to ask this question, what is the role of 5% dextrose? It has got both mechanical and pharmacological effects. The mechanical effect, actually, it is a fluid under force which lessens the additions and improves the blood flow. And increase in local glucose increase will cause stabilization of neural activity, regulates the glucose metabolism, and lessens the neuropathic pain. And there are multi multifactorial reasons why 5% dextrose can be used. So basically, I'm not going to explain all the reasons. So it has got both mechanical and pharmacological effects to cause reduction of the entrapment of median nerve. So what are the guidelines? You need to give three sessions of 5% dextrose injection, four weeks apart, around 10 ml of 5% dextrose each session, and do not combine steroids and PRP. Do not combine steroids and 5% dextrose always try to use one particular drug to gauge the success rate of these injections. There are some percutaneous techniques which are actually available. The Mayo Clinic technique wherein you use the epidural noodle, hook around 2-0 nylon and try to release the carpal tunnel in severe cases. You can use a Sonex Health. Again, it is available only in the United States and Australia. Probably next year we are bringing it. This is going to cost $250 where you have a small little knife, percutaneous insertion under ultrasound guidance, release it, something like a true cut needle it is, release it with a knife so that you could be successful. There is a percutaneous technique which is available for release of the flexor retinaculum even in severe cases. Moving on, this is another patient, 65-year-old orthopedic surgeon who actually has a ulnar tunnel syndrome, that is a cubital tunnel syndrome, where the cubital tunnel, in the cubital tunnel, you could see the 
ulnar nerve actually is swollen the ulnar nerve is swollen and this is because of a thickened osbond ligament which is roofing the cubital tunnel again injection of 5% dextrose around the nerve it's very difficult to see the nerve on the long axis ideally it should be done on the long axis of the nerve i have done it in the short axis of the nerve around the nerve if you inject 5% dextrose even if it is a little intraneural you really don't have the chance of any neural injury that's the advantage of using 5% dextrose posterior intraosseous nerve entrapment i think most of you would have an access to ultrasound as i told you please try to look in for these peripheral nerves because posterior intraosseous nerve entrapment is not so uncommon you will have only a thumb drop you won't have a wrist drop when you have a posterior intraosseous nerve entrapment here you could see this is the radius these are the two heads of the supinator there and you have a fibro fatty plane which contains the posterior intraosseous nerve where i am doing a hydro release with 5% dextrose that's the nerve basically in all these entrapments you are basically doing a structural release of the nerve with 5% dextrose or even steroids can be used this is one important image where i think all of you could appreciate there is a ulnar claw hand there is a post traumatic ulnar claw hand in a patient who is a very young fellow 30 years man who tried to hold his bike when he was falling down not a very major injury but he had developed wrist pain along with a ulnar claw hand following which when we did an ultrasound there is a small little irregularity there was a query hamet fracture he went in for a ct where there was a hamet fracture rather there was a hook of hamet fracture for which he had to undergo a decompression a surgical decompression and you could see it got corrected the ulnar claw hand got corrected it's not essentially an entrapment which you are trying to diagnose and treat here you are trying to treat all these neurological conditions the neuropathic conditions rather either by interventions or by surgery one very important condition is meralgia paresthetica Meralgia paresthetica is nothing but entrapment of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve just below the inguinal ligament. You know the risk factors: a tight belt line, an obese patient, somebody who has a a female who tries to uh, tie a uh, tight in skirt. All these patients do develop a meralgia paresthetica. So how do you diagnose meralgia paresthetica? Either it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Again, a lot of differential diagnoses are there. You should uh, rule out a facetal referred pain. you should also rule out if there is anything like a radiculopathy or sometimes a peripheral neuropathy or post herpes status so where do you look for a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is just above this is the anterior superior leg spine and trying to image the sartorius that's a inverted triangle sartorius you could see there is a fat filled tunnel fat filled flat tunnel where you have the lateral and the anterior branches of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve doing an in plane needling getting into the flat filled flat tunnel giving in a perineural 5% dextrose injection trying to release it there is a, a little bigger nerve there if it is pathological it will be definitely enlarged so you would see a bigger nerve as you try to hydro inject around the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve again it has to be done at least 2 to 3 sittings for consistent results in pain relief and see here do not use steroids for this injection always use 5% dextrose for beginners it might look a little bit meaningless to inject 5% dextrose always 
but it is one of the most efficient ones for treating entrapment syndromes. This is one important image which I wanted to share. A common peroneal nerve at the head of the fibula. This is the head of the fibula and you could see there is a common peroneal nerve and there is a small cystic structure there. That cystic structure turned out to be a ganglion. This was shared by one of my friends, Dr. Sadashivan. Just sharing the video there. This is the nerve. It's the head of the fibula. You could see there is a small cyst. It's, these are very rare pictures. You do not get it regularly. This is the common peroneal nerve ganglion. Okay. I think, I think I have done a very, very short lecture trying to make it comfortable for everyone to learn so that the idea was to search for these entrapment syndromes rather than teaching you the entire detail of these entrapment syndromes. Thank you so much. Do register for our conference. It's one of those landmark conferences which you are going to attend. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madan. It's an excellent uh, short presentation, but it's a very excellent presentation with a lot of take-home messages, uh, not only uh, related to the intervention, but also the clinical uh, findings and uh, uh, the correct diagnosis and selecting the patient for the uh, interventions. Uh, I have some queries uh, yeah, for taking up from the uh, from the this thing. Uh, see, uh, is there uh, any role of pulsed radio frequency in no entrapment syndromes? See, pulsed radio frequency is something. See, pathologically, these entrapment syndromes are by mechanical factors. Mechanical factors in the sense there could be a small ligament, there could be an interfacial plane, there could be something related to a trauma, maybe intra or an extra neural cyst or a sometimes a pathology or post-traumatic pathology. All these are reasons. To relieve the pain, you can actually suggest a pulsed uh, radio frequency. Particularly what you are asking is probably a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, LFCN. But I would say doing a LFCN injection means that you are going to release, release it. That will be the best choice rather than actually doing a pulsed RF because it is a mixed nerve. Sorry, it's, it's a sensory nerve rather. Okay. You are going to give a pulsed RF and you are going to create probably a numbness numbness for a short period, short period of time. Instead, you can just do a release with 5% dextrose. Maybe every three months also you can do it. And once they do a lifestyle modification, definitely they will get better. But current amount of evidence points towards only 5% dextrose rather than 5% dextrose, better than steroid, better than uh, pulse tariff. Okay, uh, you use uh, 10 ml volume for every uh, entrapment syndromes or is it a dose of uh, variation? No, 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 no. Actually, see, 10 ml is the recommended and suggested dose for any carpal tunnels. Okay. okay. And if it is for different nerves, actually, I personally believe that all these entrapment syndromes should be injected on the long axis perineurally. But many times we don't really get the nerves, actually. So around 3 to 4 ml is much sufficient for smaller nerves. For a bigger nerve like median nerve into the carpal tunnel, you require 10 ml. Okay. Uh, see, uh, there are a lot of questions related to how to prepare 5% dextrose. Do you use that 5% dextrose, 500 ml volume, that uh, same thing, or you prepare 5% dextrose? I, I use the same sterile 5% dextrose, which is available in the market. Okay, 500 ml volume that uh, that bottle only. Uh, use. And and okay. and and use it for only one patient. Do not keep it for the next day. These are rules okay. which I think like everybody has to follow. Okay. Uh, related to needling, you are emphasizing again and again over the 26 uh, gauge one and a half inch needle. Is there any uh, specific reason for that? Uh, see, see, thing is like infiltration of uh, local anesthetic at the start of the procedure. I, I normally try to use only 0 0.5, 0 0.2 ml of local anesthetic just to enter. That's all. So if I, if I really want to uh, do it with a slightly bigger needle, then probably more local anesthetic will be law, uh, given and I would lose the specificity of the procedure. See, the procedure must be to give a perineural 
dextrose it is not perineural uh, local anesthetic so to give dextrose i don't really want local anesthetic local anesthetic is only for the skin that is why i choose a little rather non painful needle that is 26 gauge needle nothing more really speaking means like uh, if you really have uh, had a uh, look at the retinaculum in a cadaver or even a surgical procedure even a surgeon is doing you just have a look it's a slightly bigger uh, retinaculum which we are looking at normally and your 26 gauge needle or 18 gauge needle rather doesn't uh, really like make any difference because like your needle penetration is going to go through one single point of entry it is not really any release or anything whatever we are seeing the effect of this particular carpal tunnel injection is by 5% dextrose rather than your needle so i personally believe that your needle penetration is just to satisfy yourself rather than actually giving any kind of relief to the patient by relief of mechanical uh, by way of mechanical relief definitely your 5% dextrose is the one which is going to do the job than the needle okay no no uh, i just uh, asking about does uh, some people asking about the, either you use 26 one and a half inch needle one and a half you... see the, with that one and a half inch needle the same needle can be used for local anesthetic and entry into the carpal tunnel also but you don't inject uh, perineural local anesthetic right you, you inject no, only i I, i don't inject perineural local anesthetic at all no never okay Okay, so you use only five percent extra. Only five percent extra. Percent. See, see, there are times you know, like uh, where you need to see something like I think Guru also would agree that if you are going to go for a facet joint injection, I think the volume is going to be hardly one mL. Okay, I am not going to inject some two three mL where you lose the specificity of the procedure. Basically, what I want is once I inject, inject only five percent extra, only perineural, nothing more. Okay, so you uh, so uh, after the procedure, the post procedure, what type of instructions you want to give? You want to take see, the patient with post, medication. See, post procedure, post procedure, as always. Like, uh, see, there are a couple of very important take home points which I want to tell. If you are going to do a radial side needling, you will always tend to hit the FCR tendon, that is flexor carpi radialis tendon. So you will always have a post procedure soreness of the thumb. so the patient will always try to have a difficulty in moving the thumb so give an ice pack definitely yes so for which i always try to do only an ulnar side needling only problem is you might actually touch the ulnar artery and the nerve which you can easily avoid try to do a pc form down maneuver so that you can enter into the carpal tunnel easily so always try to do an ulnar side needling a uh, uh, ice pack and paracetamol for 2 to 3 days and nothing more is required and you need to educate your patient that this is not for pain relief this is for remodeling your median nerve so remodeling your median nerve means that it takes at least 6 weeks for remodeling so i will always suggest go for 2 to 3 injections depending on the type of relief the patient presents with patients who have numbness always take a lot of time patients who have motor weakness they take lot of time that is why i say patients with motor weakness patients with severe form of carpal tunnel syndrome they always qualify for surgery patients with mild to moderate mild to moderate without any uh, motor weakness they qualify for the intervention so always try to see not all your carpal tunnel patients should be subjected to intervention interventions are limited for mild to moderate patients severe patients should always be subjected to surgery Uh, is there any complications or precautions we have to take by for using five percent dextrose? Like uh, no, there, the... there is there is nothing actually. We are going to give it only in the local environment. So the local environment injection of five percent dextrose is going to actually benefit. Even if it is a diabetic, you really need not worry. So it is going to be a local injection of five percent dextrose. So it does not have any systemic effects at all. Uh, is there any role for diagnostic block with local anesthetic in nerve entrapment syndromes i feel i feel all these blocks are to be labeled as diagnostic come therapeutic blocks okay so essentially i feel like by giving a 5% dextrose injection you really don't uh, means like you may not get the local anesthetic effect you want 
but definitely like you will get a long term see for any diagnostic block definitely you will wait for 24 hours if it is a local anesthetic definitely the patient is going to say pain relief is there once you give it they will have pain relief immediately suppose if it is a carpal tunnel or a cubital tunnel immediately there will be some pain relief we we really tend to mistake that actually it is not in no way specific actually so better give a 5% dextrose injection take it as a diagnostic and therapeutic block i i have seen plenty of even very senior pain physicians uh, really like they are not very comfortable with 5% dextrose because we are not able to gauge it gauge the success of the procedure because patient tends to complain about pain even after 4 weeks really i'm telling you carpal tunnels definitely have a huge role to play that the 5% dextrose has got a huge role to play you need to uh, see the uh, what to say like you can see the size of the nerve you can look at the long axis of the nerve try to see if there is a, a reduction on the compression and more importantly you can see small fascicles which are starting to appear within the nerve that means that you are what to say like those fascicles are indicative that the nerve is actually getting into normal yeah uh, say so, uh, what what will be the how how uh, frequency like uh, how how long you will inject it how many injection in what will be the uh, see tip, this thing typically you need to have two things before injection one is a diagnostic ultrasound before that you need to have a nerve conduction study so both of which actually are equal they go hand in hand you cannot just say that i don't have a nerve conduction study i've got a huge nerve i want to inject no there are a lot of times a big nerve by ultrasound study i have sent for nerve conduction study it came out to be non carpal tunnel syndrome demyelinating sometimes like a peripheral neuropathy all that actually has come up never do without these two both ultrasound and nerve conduction study both are required number 2 day one of the procedure you always educate these patients that they are not they are not getting a pain intervention done they are getting a remodeling intervention done and it has to be done every four weeks for three sittings and if three sittings the patient is not getting all right then probably you will have to relook at the diagnosis and relook at the choice of treatment probably he or she may require surgery so you want to inject every week for every four weeks every four weeks into three times three the sittings same, same protocol three, three sittings, sittings. Okay. three sittings uh, the same thing for myalgia also or yeah, myalgia everything for... every entrapment syndrome i'll tell you no entrapment syndrome can be treated with one injection of 5% dextrose so entrapment syndrome means there is a mechanical compression that mechanical compression should be relieved only with repeated injections of 5% dextrose you can do it every week also not a problem the protocol is to inject every 4 weeks for 3 sittings okay is there any scientific reason for that uh, prolongation that 4 weeks duration or uh, should we wait after single injection is there any scientific no actually there there are there are mild cases which respond to uh, uh, even a single injection not a problem actually but even though there are some histological evidences to say that there is an improvement of your uh, compression definitely like it is only by clinical methods which they have found out i think like uh, you must have read dr stanley lamb's articles i think some two three articles he has a uh, lot of meta analysis also are coming up that it is only these three sittings which are essential and the duration apart actually you should give at least a four weeks duration in between uh what type of anti neuropathic medications you will prefer for nerve entrapment syndrome patients like the do you prefer uh, duloxetine or uh... i uh, if you if you really ask me i don't prefer any anti neuropathic agents okay okay so you you, you rely only on the physical oh, no. physical oh, therapy plus see uh, if, as, as means like i think we cut short that discussion after the procedure we need to give paracetamol ice packs and probably like for the next 4 weeks use the splint continue with the splint actually okay okay continue with the night splints uh when will you uh, uh, select the botox for uh, your therapy See, botox therapy? botox is something which i have not used for carpal tunnel but there are literature of say around 18 patients have been conducted done and all these patients botox has been used by injecting into the muscle it is rather not injected into the tendon so uh, the, the muscle actually gets relaxed there is less tension on these tendons 
by which your carpal tunnel uh, syndrome is getting relieved that's the that's a mechanism which has been given actually but i don't have any personal experience around 50 units in distributed uh, uh, alicots it's given into the muscle okay okay thanks man thank you thank you very uh, nice discussion and uh, sir edward sir is there any other question from your Just side go on the next session Okay, okay. Rajesh, sir, Rajesh, sir, can I add something on Pulse Star? Yeah, 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 Guru, yeah, Guru. Yeah, Guru, please. Yeah, sir, Pulse Star of, yes, obviously, hydro dissection, those things are very important for entrapment. Yes, yes. you can try Pulse Star of because still the debate is there whether Pulse Star of works or not, even for other conditions like DRG, whether it's going to work or not. Again, the thing is, it is not going to harm. It, usually, Pulse Star of don't produce any numbness because the temperature is set at uh, 40 no Yeah. Yeah, it's it's don't do harm. But I had got good results for shoulder in doing uh, suprascapular. Now I try because I don't have any option. I tried a, a steroid injection. Most of the time I do steroid injections. Now people are doing your hydro distension. So now I always try, but nothing works. Then I think I try pulse stuff. My my worry is only one thing, Doctor Guru. Actually, uh, it is basically we are not doing a nerve uh, related injection. We are trying to release a uh, addition or sometimes like, you know, something mechanical which we are trying to do. I think Pulse yeah. Tariff does not do that. Yeah. Yeah. I understood, sir. I, you did everything. You did hydro distension. Still the patient is... No, no. You can, for, for relief of pain, definitely, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, it's uh, if you are dried everything and the patient is still symptomatic, I think Pulse Tariff is not going to harm the patient. So True. you can try. I had tried in shoulders, but it has given good results so far. But yeah, it yeah. never gives results every time. It's nothing like you try, you will, you will get the leave. No, you are actually hydro distension. Dissection is trying to take up the pathology. Yeah. And this is just a palliative procedure. The patient is suffering. Okay, at least try something which is going to work. I think pulse star of can be tried, but only okay. as a last option. It is, it, it is worth trying. And uh, even if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter actually. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, harm. Yeah, it doesn't harm. True. Uh, I, have, I have done in uh, Meralgia Parasthetica where I do 5% dextrose hydro distension followed by that pulse star of, as a neuromodulation. Sometimes it works actually. One or two patients, they got some uh, good pain relief. That's why I asked. I think if, that, if Dr. Madan is doing, I think he can keep it as a control, combining hydro distension with uh, hydro dissection with uh, pulse star of. You make it as a control. You do one like, 10 studies, 10. I think you, you are the best person to do those studies because we are not seeing that and, much common. And and I'll tell you, uh, this tunnel actually, you know, like uh, LFCN, which we are trying to see is much, much less than the belt line actually, much lower. Uh, essentially, the hydro dissection, the needle should be from caudal to cranial so that you, you give in your 5% dextrose along the course of the nerve on its long axis. That is actually coming up. So what we are doing is a short axis injection. The long axis injection Corded to cranial, that's going to be the next uh, way of intervention, probably. Uh, Mother, before closing, there is a one interesting question. Like, where else you use 5% dextrose in, in any bursa injection, sub, subdeltoid, anserin? See, uh, I, 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 I will tell you, actually. Like, uh, these are very two specific uh, questions which has been asked. See, pes anserinus, I think like a lot of, lot of people have been using steroids. I think I was using quite a lot of steroids with good success. If it was a bursitis, definitely, yes, I will use only a steroid even now. But very clearly, what is pes anserinous bursitis is because there is a tendinopathy of the pes anserinous complex. It's a tendon. It's a tendon which has become weak. By injecting steroids, we are making it weaker. That's the reason. If you have significant amount of fluid, probably you can aspirate it and just leave it as such. Or maybe an NSAIDs course. Or you can aspirate it, put in 5% dextrose or it must be injected PRP. Something which is actually something which is emerging. Second thing is for a subacromial bursa. Subacromial bursa, again, a patient who has got a tendinopathy deserves 5% dextrose than a steroid. If the patient has a tear, tear Definitely, as you know, PRP. If the patient has got only a tendinopathy, I think 5% dextrose is much more than sufficient. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall we move on to the next one? Um, yeah. The next presentation is by uh, Dr. Vishnu Kumar.
uh, he is from hosur uh, chakra hospital hosur uh, consulting pain physician from there and he is going to enlighten us with his video presentation on splanchnic now neurolysis how he does it and it is for uh, upper abdominal uh, malignancies over to you dr vishnu sir uh, good morning sir yeah yes, you can start sir am i audible sir yeah you are audible your uh, screen is visible the presentation is fine sir, Fine, sir. Uh, thank you edward sir thank you rajesh sir for this uh, opportunity and uh, good morning uh, everyone all attendees especially the postgraduate students i purposefully wanted to put this topic for two reasons there are uh, two exam questions related to this topic uh, i'll be teaching the basics of anatomy and how the procedure is done and then uh, the who pain ladder pattern and second thing once i uh, end my slide i just wanted to know i wanted to explain you what is pain medicine what all we do as an uh, pain physician and what are all the career options that is available after your post graduation study so let us move to the topic per se uh, i have not uh, made it as a complete uh, video session because uh, if i put it as a video definitely you youngsters will not understand so i have explained each and every step uh, as a photographic images and in the end i'll be sharing you all the entire video uh, so that it will be very helpful for you to understand so first step uh, if you see uh, this is the most important exam question what do you mean by the who step ladder pattern see any patient who comes with the chronic pain chronic pain means pain which is persisting more than 3 months so initially uh, you will be calculating a score whether you do an nrs score or vas score or something nrs score is the simple thing numerous rate numerical rating scale so it has a scale from 0 to 10 so 0 means you are suffering from no pain 10 means you are suffering from a very severe pain that is you are amputating a finger uh, without giving any anesthesia so if the patient is saying that he is having an nrs score of 0 to 3 then you can start with non opioid analgesics and nsaids okay non opioid analgesics and nsaids one minute so you can start with non opioid analgesics and nsaids like paracetamol diclofenac and everything but if the patient says that uh, if the pain score is between 4 to 6 then you have to start with weak opioids like tramadol tapentadol and all these things but still if the patient is telling you sir i am having a pain with an nrs score of 7 to 9 or 10 then you have to start off with opioids like morphine buprenorphine pethidine and all these things so if the pain is not relieved with all those things then we have a step 4 which includes interventions nerve blocks epidurals patient control analgesia pumps neurolytic block therapy and spinal stimulators so keeping this who world uh, who <coughs> pain ladder as a basic we are going to step into this okay so this is a very important exam question you have to draw this diagram and you have to mark it properly so just by seeing the diagram the examiner will think that okay you have known the concept and you can score the marks it is basically an important five mark question and uh, coming to the topic per uh, per se this planchnic nerve block can provide a pain relief of chronic visceral uh, upper abdominal pain either it can be malignant or non malignant malignant conditions like uh, ca gallbladder ca pancreas ca stomach okay a non malignant condition mostly i'll be doing uh, chronic pancreatitis atrophic pancreatitis i'm doing this um, Uh, splanchnic nerve neurolysis and this splanchnic nerves transmit the majority of nociceptive information from the viscera okay so this is another important question uh, the autonomic nervous system that is the sympathetic nervous uh, supply of the organs that we'll be uh, seeing in the next slide and this splanchnic nerve is formed by the greater lesser and least splanchnic nerves the greater is from the t5 to t9 segments lesser is from the t9 to t11 segments and the least is from t12 segments respectively from the spinal cord so if you see 
Okay, uh, this is the functional anatomy. Here you can see um, a sympathetic chain which contains of sympathetic ganglia, sympathetic trunk, sympathetic ganglia, and this is called as the sympathetic trunk, which is present on the either side of the vertebral body. Okay, either side of the spinal col uh, spinal column, and from here the sympathetic nerves reach the various organs like um, thoracic viscera, abdominal viscera. And this sympathetic chain is present in the entire spinal cord. It is present from the cervical region and ends at the level of the coccyx where they unite to form the ganglion impar. And now this is the very important slide, sympathetic innervation of the viscera. See sympathetic nervous system starts from T1 to L2. So sympathetic innervation is from the thoracolumbar outflow, whereas the parasympathetic innervation is from the craniosacral outflow. In cranial region, we have oculomotor nerve, third nerve, facial nerve, seventh nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, ninth nerve, vagus nerve, tenth nerve, and S2 and S3 uh, sacral nerves. These six nerves form the parasympathetic outflow, whereas the sympathetic outflow is from the thoracolumbar region. That is a very important MCQ question because the sympathetic chains will come from here and this sympathetic chain is going to go up into the cervical sympathetic chain and it is going to supply the organs of the head and neck. And you see uh, the entire body is supplied by the sympathetic system. Okay, see the upper limb has a sympathetic system innervation of T1 to T3. Okay, whereas the thoracic viscera has a sympathetic innervation from T1 to T5. That's why the sympathetically mediated pain is always non-segmental. It is ill-defined. A patient is coming with the MI, myocardial infarction. He is not localing his pain to the chest. Of course, he does because of the inflammation of the uh, pericardium. And he always says that, sir, my pain is radiating to the trapezius muscle. It is going to the upper limb because of this. The thoracic uh, visceral has been innervated from T1 to T5. The upper limb is also innervated from T1 to T3. And of course, it is going to the, uh, from these things, it is going to radiate to the upper limbs also. Now, here, coming to the topic per se, we see that this T5 to T9, they unite to form a greater splanchnic nerve. And the T9, T12, they form lesser splanchnic nerve. They all join together to form the celiac ganglion. And from the celiac ganglion, the postganglionic fibers go to the respective abdominal viscera and they do innervation. So we have two nerves. The efferent nerve is efferent nerve of the upper abdominal viscera innervation is from the T5 to T12. That is the splanchnic nerve. From T5 to T12, they go to the celiac ganglion. Postganglionic fibers supply the upper abdominal viscera. Now, the afferent nociceptive fibers always travel to the celiac ganglion and they in turn merge into the splanchnic uh, plexus and from here uh, they terminate in the dorsal root and once they come to the dorsal root from the posterior spinothalamic tract the second order neuron goes to the thalamus and from here the third order neuron goes to the limbic system and the somatosensory cortex. This is how the pain is perceived. So whenever there is an inflammation, whenever there is an alteration in the uh, alteration in the structure or whenever there is a mechanical deformity, the patients will be, uh, the somatosensory cortex will be stimulated. Along with that, the limbic system will be stimulated. That's why when you see a patient with pancreatitis, he will not be happy because the limbic system is stimulated. That will control the emotion. You can see them in the dull face keeping their hands touching to the stomach. So this is the main thing because their limbic system is stimulated. Okay, now to the topic per se. Now you can see from the T5, to, this is the parasagittal anatomy. So this is the splanchnic nerve, greater splanchnic nerve from T5, T6, uh, T7, T8 uh, and T9. They unite to form the greater splanchnic nerve, T10 and T11, they form the lesser and T12, they form the least. Okay, and now all these three things are P-ganglionic to celiac 
uh, ganglion. Okay. Now they these three splanchnic nerves pierce the crust of the diaphragm and they uh, they uh, coalesce uh, into the celiac ganglion. Now, if you see this uh, splanchnic nerve, why we are targeting here? Because this splanchnic nerve, you see, the location of this splanchnic nerve is well defined. First point. <coughs> Medially, you have a vertebral body. Laterally, you have a pleura. Okay. And caudally, you have the crust of the diaphragm. And when they form the ganglion, okay, this ganglion is front of the iota. Okay. Now, when we see the anterior view, see here, this is the anterior view. This is the celiac ganglion. And from the sympathetic chain, you have got uh, the greater, lesser and least. Okay. So, celiac ganglion can vary from 2 to 5 in number in front of the iota. Okay. And see here, they have got the sympathetic afferent and efferent fibers and they have also got the parasympathetic fibers. So, what is the role of the sympathetic <coughs> fibers? The sympathetic fibers is going to contract the sphincters, relax the smooth muscle and it is going to inhibit the secretion. The sympathetic fibers are going to carry the nociceptive information from the upper abdominal viscera. Okay, whereas the parasympathetic fibers mainly from the anterior and the posterior vagal trunk through their branch of vagus, especially the posterior vagal trunk and the anterior vagal tongue directly innervates the viscera <coughs> which helps in the uh, viscera mobility and the secretions. Okay, now uh, the main thing. Previously, uh, like uh, many years before, what they happened was uh, whenever the patient presented with any uh, upper abdominal malignancy or pancreatitis, they were telling give celiac plexus block, celiac plexus block. Now, celiac plexus block is literally obsolete. See why? The problem is you are bringing a needle and you are injecting local anesthesia and alcohol. Okay. But the amount of drug that you are giving. <coughs> You are not sure whether your drug is reaching the ganglion 100% effectively so that you can get a 100% good result. So we are giving a drug in an assumption that, okay, it is going to spread here. But now, as you see in this diagram here, the location of this planktonic nerve, everything is prefixed. So you bring your needle here at the level of T11. You do a radio frequency ablation. You are targeting the nerve. You are burning the nerve so that the duration of pain relief is excellent. And I am doing a comparative analysis. Till now, there is no comparative analysis. Just few paper presentations are there comparing celiac plexus and this planktonic nerve. And I have done around like 30 cases of this and I am still uh, writing on this, uh, the comparative evaluation of both the splanchnic nerve and the uh, celiac plexus neurolysis. And um, I'm just going to discuss what I have done to my patient today. Okay, so I hope you understand this uh, diagram. So when you want to do a celiac plexus, you bring a needle here. You directly bring from the needle here, you keep it in a, and <clears throat> you're not a, uh, uh, exactly, exactly destroying the nerve. <coughs> you're not exactly destroying the plexus. Basically, you're just giving a drug. Uh, you're assuming that, okay, it is going to spread here and it is going to block in either direction. So whatsoever it is, either you do under fluoroscopic guidance, whether you do under endoscopic guidance, I have done CT robotic guided uh, celiac plexus block also. But even then, the results of splanctic neurolysis are extremely far, far greater. Okay, now how I'm going to do a procedure. Okay, so let us go step by step. First, I'll be taking an X-ray PA view. So posterior anterior view. So this is the uh, 12th rib because after this, the vertebra do not contain any rib. So this is the 12th rib and this is the 11th rib. <coughs> the 11th rib, um, 11th vertebra and 12th vertebra, um, thoracic vertebra are the area of interest. So I'm going to mark this vertebra. Okay, so... So this is how I keep my patient. I'll keep my patient lie in the prone position. And this is the fluoroscopic uh, image. So you'll be taking a PA view. And uh, this is uh, how the patient has been uh, placed in the supine position. Okay. And this is the spine model. First thing is that you have to take an AP view. And this is the, the red one is the L1 vertebra. This is 
thoracic T12 vertebra and this is the T11 vertebra. T11 vertebra is the point of interest. Whenever you do uh, celiac plexus, you, the L1 vertebra is the point of interest. Okay. Now, whenever you are taking a PA view, so as we discussed in the diagram, the sympathetic ganglia lies here and this is the sympathetic trunk. The sympathetic trunk is nothing but the axon and here you have got a sympathetic ganglia and again here this is the sympathetic trunk and this is the sympathetic ganglia. Both the sympathetic ganglia and sympathetic trunk uh, is called as the sympathetic chain which is present on the either side of the vertebral body. Okay, and uh, you take a lateral portion and in this lateral portion, your sympathetic chain lies this way. Okay, so you have to keep this um, uh, location of the sympathetic chain uh, very uh, important. Okay, so now you take a lateral view and that is how you get the uh, previous image. And here you can see the sympathetic chain, how it has been aligned here. Now, in the lateral view, if you see, So, the, this is the T11 vertebra and this is the T12 vertebra. From T5 to T9, the greater uh, splanctic nerve is coming like this from the posterior to anterior and uh, T, uh, the lesser splanctic nerve from uh, T10 and T11, they are joining and uh, it is at the level of the T11 vertebra and it is fixed. Okay. And now the T12 uh, least splanctic nerve is coming here. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a radio frequency ablation. So I'll tell you what is radio frequency ablation later. So by this image, you can come to a logic that once you keep your needle here and once you burn the tissues, obviously you can target both these nerves. And then I give a alcohol and it is going to cover this nerve also. And the most majority of the neural tissue can be destroyed so that the duration of pain relief will be more than one year. More than one. This is a simple concept. But when you do a celiac plexus, I have seen patients coming to me after one month or two months coming and say, again, the pain is coming. Because you are not targeting the nerves. See, all these three nerves are joined to form the celiac uh, ganglion and celiac plexus later. Okay, now this is the uh, orientation. Okay, now if you see all these uh, sympathetic chain, uh, from here the nerves are going from the lateral to median portion. See, whenever you do an X-ray, you are going to do only a two-dimensional image. You are not going to see a three-dimensional image. This is the three-dimensional orientation of the nerves. The green one is the greater splanchnic. Uh, so this uh, violet one is uh, the lesser and the another one is the least. This is the uh, thoracic 11, uh, T11 vertebra and this is the T12 vertebra and this is the L1 vertebra. See L1 vertebra, they do not have ribs. T12 vertebra, they do have ribs. Now, uh, I hope you have understood the background of this uh, one. Let us start with the procedure. And let me do my case. This is a 50 year male. It's a case of end stage carcinoma of pancreas. No signs and symptoms suggestive of intestinal obstruction. No evidence of ascites. There is no diarrhea, no hemodynamic instability. The RFT is normal. Bleeding profile is normal. And CT abdomen, this is a very important point I wanted to say. CT abdomen, mating of celiac plexus with adjacent solid and hollow viscera. So what happens whenever there is an atrophic pancreatitis or whenever there is any carcinoma, the surrounding structures are completely destroyed. So the normal anatomy of the celiac plexus itself is destroyed. Okay, and there is a compression. So when you are doing a celiac plexus, you cannot say that confirmly that, okay, I'm going to give this drug. It is going to destroy my entire No, no, you cannot say that. And the literature is coming now. So you have to do a splanchnic plexus block to get an effective relief. And now the patient is on tablet morphine 120 milligram per day. And he's on anti-neuropathics, tablet pregabalin. And uh, he came to me sir, and he was telling me, he was literally touching my foot. Sir, please help me some more. Even if it takes like five minutes of delay while taking morphine, I'm having severe pain. It's like someone taking the knife and directly putting it in my stomach. So he, he just came to me and he told me, uh, sir, please help me out. Otherwise, if you cannot relieve my pain, give me some medicine and make me die. 
This is what he told me. Literally, this is what he told me and he was begging me. So he was having, um, because of this pregabalin, he was having an excessive sedation. And because of this tablet morphine, despite taking Crimafin Plus, he himself used to keep enema every day just to pass motion. All these were the side effects of opioids. Okay. And now, uh, come here. Okay, now this patient has been planned for splanchnic neurolysis, combined radiofrequency and alcohol ablation. So pre-off preparation, uh, vitals monitoring, uh, BP, SpO2, ECG was been done. Preloading 500 ml of intravenous fluid, NS was given and I have given ceftriaxone 1 gram. Okay, and patient portion, I kept in a prone portion with pillow beneath the hip so that his abdomen is entirely free. Uh, and then I just wanted to ensure that I'm not compressing his IVC also. Okay, so these are the material used. I use 25 gauge, 15 centimeter RF needle with 10 millimeter active tip. I'll tell you what is RF now. And I use some extension tubings, syringes, local dexamethasone and contrast. Okay, this is very important. Whenever I use, you can see my needle. See here, the tip of my needle is bent. I just wanted to purposefully show, uh, one minute. Yeah, see, uh, the tip of my needle is bent. Okay, so why I'm bending this needle? Because that is going to uh, help in my navigation. The tip usually directs my needles. So if my uh, if I'm keeping my tip in this direction above, as I push, my needle will go up. You can see, as I push inside the body, my needle will go up. And as I come down, it will come up. So the direction, this will help me to navigate where I should go. Okay, and the procedure site is uh, clean and draped. Now, uh, starting of the procedure, first time doing it on the left side, I'm going to mark the superior lateral portion of the T12 vertebral body. I just want to make sure that my entry portion uh, is above the ribs. <clears throat> See, now uh, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the T11 vertebral body and I want to make sure I am marking my point here so that I just wanted to go above the ribs. So, I will enter my needle in this direction. I hope you can see this one. Uh, I will enter my needle in this direction. So, basically, I want to rotate my spinal cord. This is just a spine model. So I'm just rotating a spinal cord like 15 degree so that I can see the rib and make sure that my needle is crossing in this manner. Okay. Now, <clears throat> first I'll be taking an ipsilateral oblique view of 10 to 15 degree. So once I take, I can see a thickened line, which is nothing but the pleura. Now I have inserted my needle in the superior lateral portion of the T11 vertebra. Okay. And now I take the lateral view. Now, why I just want to go above the rib? Because here you can see this is the foramen. Okay. This is the foramen. See, through the foramen, the uppermost portion has the nerve root. So, I am ensuring that if I go above the rib, I will always go through the lower portion of the foramen so that I will not injure my spinal nerve. So, after this, uh, I am very pretty much sure that my needle is in a perfect direction. And now, see, I am showing in my image model. See, here you have got the ribs. Just above the rib, I am just going and this is the nerve root and my needle is exactly below the nerve root. Okay. And now I want to make sure that my needle is gracing the vertebral body on its lateral surface in the AP view. Can you see this is the T11. So this is where the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves are present. And now I'm just subsequent lateral view images. I'm just inserting my needle slowly inside. I'm seeing whether my needle is going in the right direction. And now the final needle portion in the lateral view. The final needle portion is always at the junction of anterior one third and the posterior two third. Okay. Now keep this image in your mind and then compare the previous image where I showed you the nerves. Let me see. Let us see that again. 
Okay, now this is my final image. Can you see in this uh, spine model, this uh, my needle is grazing over the vertebral body. Uh, the vertebral body acts as a very important landmark here. It is just grazing over the vertebral body where I can be, uh, I, where uh, the nerves are there. Okay, so this is at the junction of anterior one third and the posterior two third. Okay, and final needle portion in the APV. APV also, you can see that my needle is grazing the vertebral body. Okay, so similarly, I am doing it in the opposite side as well. So you can see both the needles coming here. And finally, both the needles are exactly in the anterior one third and posterior two third junction. And this is the final image of my needle. Okay, now what happens? I am just doing a radio frequency ablation. So in simple terms, what is radio frequency ablation? Okay, I'm just going to show you this. See, radio frequency is nothing but this is the needle where you give electricity. The electricity is going to produce radio frequency uh, field. And this needle tip is placed near the nerve. And this radio frequency is going to cause oscillation of the ions. And this oscillation of the ions is going to produce heat energy. And that heat is going to destroy your nerve. This process is called as ionic heating. So it does not heat the probe directly. The ionic oscillation is going to heat the probe. And it is ultimately going to destroy the nerve. So for this radio frequency to happen, what you have to do you have to ensure that your needle see here as you see in this image now your radio frequency needle tip should needle should be parallel to the nerve this is the most important prerequisite and as it generates the heat it will destroy the tissue nerve tissue which is surrounding to it okay so and these are some of the parameters so the resistance is always less than 200 ohms. As you can see in this image, my here you can see my resistance is around 155 or something. And uh, you do a sensory stimulation. So sensory stimulation and motor stimulation, why you do? So because before doing any ablation here, your main target is destroying the sympathetic innervation. Okay, destroying the sympathetic inner at any cost, you should not destroy the somatic nerve fibers. Do you understand? So, whenever you do a motor stimulation, you should not see flickering of intercostal muscles or abdominal muscles. Okay, and whenever you do a sensory stimulation, the patient will say, Sir, I'm having similar pain to that I perceived before. And there should be no pain over the chest indicating that you are not stimulating the intercostal muscles. Okay. So now uh, before doing a lesioning, what I'll do is I'll just give like uh, one ml of alcohol and then a radio frequency is done. So as soon as I give alcohol, you can see my resistance is uh, dropping down from 155 to 116. And then I used to do a double lesion with a temperature of 80 degrees and duration of 90 seconds. Okay. So now you can see, imagine that, wait, let me show you. Yeah. Now you can see my needle is here. Okay, my needle is here. When I am going to do a radio frequency ablation, I am going to destroy both these two nerves. Okay, I am going to destroy both in the right and left side. Now, but the thing is, if I want to do in the least, if I want to destroy my least planktonic nerve, again, I have to do the same procedure at the T12 level. But now what I am doing is, I am just using two needles and I am combining the radio frequency ablation with the alcohol neurolysis. So when I give alcohol, what happens? The drug is going to spread from here till here and it is going to destroy the many more segments of the splanchnic nerve. So this is the rational aid behind. And now as you see, the nerves are coming from uh, uh, posterior to anterior and here the nerves are coming from uh, lateral to medial. Can you see it is from lateral to medial. So this is you have to imagine it as a uh, three dimensional image. Okay. So now you can see once I give my die spread here, the die spread in the AP view, it is from lateral to medial. I always give one ml of die. 
so if i give an um, alcohol solution of like uh, uh, 5 ml then i guess it is going to spread more so there was a satisfactory dye spread in ap view again in lateral view you know that my nerves are here uh, here okay and then lesser splanchnic nerve is here so i do a radio frequency ablation here and then my dye spread can you see here this is the dye spread here and now i am going to give alcohol so then this is 1 ml of dye and if i am going to give 5 ml of alcohol i am in an assumption that okay it is going to destroy my uh, least splanchnic nerve also so after i get a successful dye spread in ap and in lateral view what i am going to do so i'll take see this is the satisfactory dye spread in the bilateral in the ap view you can see this dye is going from lateral to medial so it means that all my nerves are be covered okay so i used to give 5 ml of uh, so 5 ml of 100% alcohol now what is the mechanism of alcohol for neurolysis uh, alcohol is going to cause uh, protein denaturation protein uh, coagulation and is going to destroy the nerve and thereby what happens so the nerves will get destroyed and uh, the transmission of nociceptive impulses will be abolished so post procedure precautions what i do i keep the patient prone for 30 minutes and i give ns rl 500 ml again and i do bp monitoring and uh, in the procedure i used to give paracetamol 1 gram and injection diclofenac 75 mg iv and is shifted to ward after 2 hours of observation in the recovery room okay the patient was discharged after one day of observation i just gave an analgesic uh, etoricoxib uh, for 3 days and then uh, morphine i reduced drastically for uh, like uh, <clears throat> 60 mg per day for 5 days he was taking 120 and then pregabalin mset and perinom okay and uh, advised to review after 5 days and after 1 month okay so patient status on review after 1 month so his nr score was which was like 10 out of 10 when he came present now the nr score is just 1 by 10 just 1 by 10 only taras paracetamol 650 mg on sos basis so now he came to me and he told me that just because of you i am able to do my work sir so this is something uh, a very good uh, what to say this is what the happiness and the sacrifice that you have done and the procedure that you have done this is what uh, you get in return and this is the beauty of this pain medicine okay so complication of the procedure if you are not well versed with the procedure and if you are not help uh, um if you are not thorough in identifying the pleura if you cannot make out the pleura definitely there is a chances of pneumothorax and then um, you are going to do a sympathetic blockade so definitely you will be having postural hypotension for which you have to do an adequate hydration and fistula formation al always when you give absolute alcohol you all post procedure you have to inject 5 ml of air to ensure that you are not letting you can do 5 ml of air you can give saline localize or whatever it is and then remove the needle you should not remove the needle as such because it can result in formation of fistula diarrhea can also be there diarrhea will uh, this is because of the sympathetic deactivation and sometimes if you are not uh, doing the procedure properly then it can lead to spinal cord ischemia paraparesis or paraplegia due to the damage of the somatic nerves sometimes injury to the artery of the adam quix is also going to cause all these things okay so always always stick to the basics it is very simple if you follow the basics properly what i told the di the uh, dye spread should always be from lateral to medial in ap view and from anterior to posterior in the lateral view okay so once you do this keep that in mind once you get adequate dye spread and then you perform the procedure no doubt the patient is going to have a long 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 lasting pain relief okay and then uh, neuritis neuritis is also a known complication following these uh, procedures 
mostly i have just to prevent this neuritis i'll be giving anti neuropathic drugs mainly pre gabalin and um, after my procedure i'll be giving a small dose of uh, five, uh, sorry 2 mg of dexamethasone after um, radio frequency ablation personally i have not seen uh, any patients uh, with the neuro uh, neuritis following the splanchnic nerve uh, i have usually seen while ablating this um, trigeminal neuralgia cases so thank you very much so last two minutes uh, i just wanted to talk regarding uh, what conditions do pain physician treat so whenever you are dealing with pain medicine so what is pain medicine so basically you will be treating patients with cancer pain any neuropathic pain okay any neuropathic pain like uh, secondary to entrapment syndrome or uh, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, you'll be dealing with discogenic pain okay cervical and lumbar radicular pain sciatic pain and you'll be dealing with musculoskeletal pain and um, you'll be dealing with osteoarthritis today morning i did a case uh, okay uh, 70 year old man the bilateral severe osteoarthritis of knee uh, he has a severe uh, lv dysfunction ef of 25 post ptca and he also got uh, he has also got a uh, tuberculosis okay and he is not he has got an orthopnea also so what i i kept him in propped up position i did an uh, radio frequency ablation of genicular nerves and now uh, post procedure i made him mobilize uh, he was not able to walk before now uh, just after one hour post procedure he just walked in i started this procedure by 6 am in the morning and night in the morning and 9 o'clock when i came for a review he's just walking off so that gives an happiness ideally such candidates has to be posted for tkr but uh, due to the complications in the post operative period he told that no sir i am not uh, ready to accept this i'll go for uh, radio frequency ablation so he had an excellent thing spondyloarthropathy rheumatoid arthritis Uh, and closing spondylitis many people do come with shoulder pain or back pain facetogenic pain so just with uh, doing um, some minimally invasive percutaneous spine interventions they'll be getting a very good very good relief very good relief their quality of life can basically see you cannot limit the joint restriction uh, by giving uh, dmrds one patient came to me he was not able to do um, you know, flexion extension and he was not able to do the lateral rotation what i did was i gave uh, atlanta occipital joint and injection and cervical facet injection of course he was very fine he was very fine the quality of life can be improved with the um, by doing this interventions so these are some of the modalities do um, uh, pain physicians do use first thing is uh, minimally invasive uh, percutaneous pain and spine interventions so spine intervention uh, is like a special interest group uh, like um, i do mostly do spine interventions i do root blocks uh, and then i do spine endoscopic uh, procedures endoscopic discectomy uh, in the cases of uh, sciatica i do facet uh, previously i was doing uh, facet rf but now i am just doing facet uh, directly endoscopic rhizotomy i am doing i am regularly using uh, radio frequency ablation which i told you chemical neurolysis mostly i'll be using absolute alcohol 100% alcohol and i do neuromodulation also and uh, neuromodulation i just wanted to say last month there was a program in ramaiya so where i performed uh, a case of sacral neuromodulation in patients with the uh, chronic uh, pelvic pain so neuromodulation is a very growing topic so even uh, you can apply to many painful condition and regenerative therapy i always use prp uh, for shoulder hypotonic saline for knee and in all other cases i will be using dextrose where uh, madan sir and salvas like madan sir and uh, gurumurthy sir uh, explained you today so uh, thank you very much for your patient listening so pain medicine is something uh, one of a beautiful branch uh, after your anesthesia you can very well pursue it and in case of any queries you can reach me out with uh, to my email or to my whatsapp okay thank you very much thanks a lot sir thanks a lot uh, thank you thank you vishnu uh, it was a wonderful presentation and uh, nice uh, way of compiling also the things to the uh, juniors i think uh, because of the time factors we cannot take the questions right now i think we can uh, end the session here sir edward sir any questions sir sir we can uh, end up the session thank you very yeah, much yeah. sir uh, gurumathi sir you.
Thank you, Vishnu. Uh, thank you. Presentation. Even uh, beginners can understand and they can do practice uh, for splanking the block after seeing your video. Very, very wonderful. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank you, sir. And uh, thank uh, J J Rajesh, sir, also for the coordinating today. And also, I thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, I also thank Madan Kumar Mahapandi and sir for sparing their valuable time today. I am happy to inform that uh, today's session was uh, relayed in the Pain TV also. More than 500 watched in the Pain TV. I am happy to share with you. And uh, to, to, uh, next week we are coming with a critical care update. That uh, I thank the sponsors Akurala and A1 Logist and our media partner Anastasia TV. Thank you, Anandal. We will meet next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.